Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our webinar. We're gonna go ahead and get started. So the webinar is gonna run from nine to noon. We will have two 10 minute breaks. So uh, please be sure to but pay attention to the talks because passing the poll questions and the quiz at the end are important for getting CEU credits. And know that the breaks will be coming. A little bit of quick housekeeping. We're gonna be recording this webinar for educational or promotional use. Uh, you will be muted during the webinar. Uh, please communicate with us via chat um, for comments and questions. We will be tracking the questions for our uh, speakers to answer at the end of their presentation. Um, if you chat all panelists, that's only going to the speakers. And if you chat all panelists and attendees, that's going to go to everybody who's on this webinar. So it's up to you how you want to ask questions or make comments. Um, and if you want to receive continuing education credits, you have to stay on the webinar throughout the entire duration. You cannot log on or off so during the breaks. Please don't log off. Just leave the screen up and step away and come back. Um, you have to answer all the poll questions. Um, you don't have to get the poll questions right, but you have to answer all the poll questions during the presentations. Um, and then for CCA credits, you'll be scanning the QR code um, or replying to the post-webinar email. And for DPR credits, there is going to be a final exam um, that will be sent out in a post-webinar email, and you have to uh, get a 70% or better to get your CEUs. The exams the exam is based on the poll questions, so I pay attention to the poll questions in order to ensure a good pass rate. Um, our agenda, I'm doing the welcome now. Our first presenter is Whitney Brim DeForest. She'll be talking about weeds in rice research update. Uh, then Luis Espino will be talking about rice pest management. We'll take a 10 minute break at 10.05, um, and then we'll go into an integrated pest management for processing tomatoes by veg crop advisor, Amber Vincasey Vall. I'll be talking about field crop pest management, and then we'll wrap up with regulatory updates by Scott Bowden from the Agricultural Commissioner's Office. Uh, we'll have five minutes at the end for a final wrap up in Q&A. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna shop, stop sharing my screen and Whitney, I'll go ahead and pull your slides up. Thanks, thanks for attending. Okay, good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Okay. I'll go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna be talking about uh, weeds and rice, and this is a bit of a research update from what we've been doing in the past year. Uh, so the first thing I'll cover is our weed survey. So in 2019, uh, right after harvest, uh, we did a weed survey to kind of get a comprehensive idea of what we have in terms of weeds across the valley. Um, we collected soil samples after harvest from across all of the rice growing regions. You can kind of see on the map here uh, where we collected samples from. Uh, we got 10 randomly selected sites in most of the bigger counties. And then in some of the smaller counties, we got a few uh, less sites just because the counties are a bit smaller in terms of rice growing area. So Yolo, uh, Yuba County, for example, we got only five sites each. Uh, Placer and Sacramento, just two because they're very small. Um, we sampled all the major rice growing weeds. Whoops, sorry. Uh, barnyard grass, bulrush, duck salad, our, our uh, Echinocloa watergrass species, um, Monocoria, red stem, small flowers, wrangle top, water hyssop, cattail, and rice. And this isn't completely done. I have a little bit, oh, I'm sorry, a little bit more uh, data analysis to do. Uh, but basically we grew the weeds out in the greenhouse um, for a few months to see what they, what came up in the soil. Um, the soil was again collected after harvest and that was to ensure that we weren't, uh, when we were doing the survey that we were getting all of the possible weeds that could come up in rice. Uh, if we did it during the season, there would be a possibility that we would not see everything that was in the field 
uh, because folks put out herbicides. So we did it in the fall uh, soil with soil sampling to kind of make sure that we got a comprehensive uh, overview of the weed species. And there weren't a whole lot of differences, um, I will say. Um, some of the key differences are that we saw Monocoria really only in Butte County. Um, Monocoria is one of the weed species that's on the noxious weeds list for the United States, um, for the entire US. And so it was important to um, be able to show where that was located on a map uh, in comparison to the other rice counties. Um, we did see a lot of rice come up, which is I think because uh, we were sampling in the fall um, and there was a lot of rice on the ground. There was some weedy rice uh, mixed in with the rice that we saw coming up. Um, so that was good that we were able to, to show that as well in the survey. And I didn't differentiate between the rice and weedy rice yet. Um, but basically we, the, the idea with this is that we'll have a map that will be available up on the UC rice website that will show sort of the distribution across the valley of our different weed species. Red stem and small flower were present pretty much in every field that we sampled as water hyssop was as well and uh, duck salad. Everything else varied a little bit by region. But hopefully this will be up on the UC rice website within the next few months. So the two weeds that I'm really gonna focus on today are watergrass and weedy rice. So I'll start with watergrass. So we've been dealing with an unknown watergrass species or biotype for the past few years. And to give everyone kind of a background in that, um, we had two fields that were identified in 2017. Uh, from that, Luis and I collected 10 populations for herbicide screening in 2018. Uh, we did some ID work uh, in 2017 with our UC Davis herbarium, Ellen Dean there, uh, and it was the results were inconclusive. Um, Ellen sent uh, those, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 samples that we had uh, to two different Econocloa experts, one in Texas and one in Canada, and the results were still inconclusive. Um, so it has become apparent that we need to do some genetic work, um, but the genetics work to do this is, is pretty expensive. Um, so we're starting with some herbicide screenings and phenotypic analysis, kind of like we did with the weedy rice. So looking at how the different uh, biotypes or, or samples that we collect, how they look. So I'm gonna focus on the herbicide screening here. So we, collected 10 populations in 2018. Um, two known susceptible populations were added as a comparison. Um, these were samples that were collected from the Rice Experiment Station. Um, we know that they're susceptible to our herbicides or fairly susceptible. Uh, we screened them using our highest labeled field rate. Um, it was conducted last spring in the greenhouse. Um, the herbicides were applied at the two leaf stage. So it's very early application timing. Um, and that's usually what we do for resistance screening. In the field that would correspond to something between a day of seeding up to about one and a half leaf stage of rice application, which is very early, obviously. Um, so you'll see when I when I show the foliar herbicides that they, most of them work very well. Um, the percent control we did with biomass and uh, number of plants. And we did that at 14 days after application, those two evaluations. And then it was replicated for pots per biotype. Okay, so get, to get a, an idea of what it looked like for the susceptible types, um, you can see on the left here, this is percent control by biomass and our herbicides down here on the bottom. So the first four or so are the granular uh, herbicides that we apply at the beginning of the season. And the other three are typically foliars that we apply usually at the three to four leaf stage of rice at the earliest and later on. Um, so in the susceptible populations, we saw pretty reasonable control. Again, this is greenhouse uh, screenings, but you know at least 70% for our granular applications at the beginning of the season and between 40% for regimen up to 100% for propanil uh, for the foliars. And similar uh, results with the other susceptible population. Uh, Butte is not a really well-known grass herbicide, we did include this just because a lot of folks are using it at the beginning of the season and I wanted to, to see what it looked like in the greenhouse. 
Okay, so for our, uh, these are the samples that we collected that we were unsure of the sort of resistance status of these there besides whether or not they can control these types. Um, so these three samples are from Sutter and I realize they're not grouped together, but I just kind of wanted to give people an idea what things, what it looked like. Um, so you can see that our herbicides that we're putting out at the beginning of the season don't really control this, these particular biotypes, right? Um, for the most part, the later cleanup herbicides still look pretty good. So this is not resistant. These are not resistant to these uh, herbicides, the foliar herbicides. But yes, they are looking like we have resistance to our granular applications. And this really does align pretty well with what the growers are saying in the field. Um, the, the folks that I've talked to, they're saying that when they put out their upfront herbicides, this grass seems to walk right through it. So this, this aligns pretty well with what we've been hearing in the field. Same thing with our other, other samples. So this is a susceptible compared to the Yolo County sample. And there's some variation on uh, some of these samples. Some of the granulars are working, but for the most part, not working 100%. Uh, these are our butte samples. So again, I'm giving you guys kind of an overview here. Uh, in some of the fields, Serrano appears to be still working fairly well, but for the most part, granite, bolero, and butte really are not working as, up, as upfront applications. Glen County, we had some variation. So, and I will address this in my last slide. So again, there we're still having issues, I'd say, with um, applying, uh, you know, basically sort of how we are applying our herbicides, right? So there's still some, some folks that are misidentifying or thinking they have a herbicide problem, herbicide resistance problem, when in fact, it's most likely some sort of application error. So this, this one here on the left is, is likely an application error or some sort of issue with irrigation management, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But the one on the right, again, we do have some resistance showing, right? We've got uh, granite, Bolero, and Butte really not working at all. So again, this is very preliminary data. This was only 10 samples. Uh, we collected uh, a bunch of samples this summer, 64 additional samples um, that we are going to be looking at this coming year. Um, but this, again, is some preliminary data that we can start to, to uh, talk to folks about. So the early granule herbicides really do appear to be overall quite ineffective. Um, I'm not going to say for certain that it's resistance in every case, but it might just be that this biotype naturally is not susceptible to these herbicides. Um, the foliar applied herbicides appear to still have good control, propanil regimen and clincher. Um, however, I again, I did it at an early timing. So I did it at the two leaf stage of these grasses. So if you're applying later in the season, maybe not quite as effective. And that would be something that we need to probably test in the field. Um, there's still some herbicide failures that are likely happening because of application or timing issues, like I said earlier. So we still need to work on our, on our application methodologies. Um, but it, it does appear overall that we do have some sort of resistance or these are not susceptible to, the, to, the, to at least some of our herbicides. So like I said, we'll be doing um, a bigger screening this year. Uh, and also trying to gather some phenotypic information. So how do these plants look and how do they look in comparison to what we know as um, sort of the, the species or biotypes that we've had in California for a long time. Okay, our weedy rice update. So I'm not, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time. This is the overall sort of map of all of our counties from 2016. Just to kind of remind folks where we are, we've got um, six, seven biotypes. Actually, the seventh one isn't on the map, <clears throat> but six biotypes of weedy rice distributed pretty much across the entire uh, rice growing region. Um, there's close to 14,000 acres total infested, and we did do an update this year, which I'll talk about in a moment. I'm not sure what's going on here. I'm blocking. Can can people see still? My screen says there's some sort of blocking happening. Um, we did a field survey in 2019, like we normally do. Um, 
by the end of the season. So this, this is an update from that other uh, map. Um, we did have a few new sites um, in 2019. Uh, one previous grower with two additional biotypes, and most of the new sites are type 1 weedy rice, and in 2019 we did have a new biotype, type 7. Uh, in 2020 we had three new sites, um, all type 1, one in Sutter, one in Yuba, and one in San Joaquin. Uh, we had previous growers also with new types, so that means they had a, a, at least one type already found at their site and then this past year they added another additional site. Um, we also resurveyed all of our previously found acreage. I don't have the data for that yet but uh, we we did that this year and we'll we'll be presenting that information to everyone uh, later this spring. But it was actually a very good survey. We resurveyed all the fields that had weedy rice um, in the past four years to see sort of what the status was this year. And then we also surveyed uh, fields around those fields to see if there was any weedy rice that had moved into the fields around them. I will give an update really quick on suppress. So I've been talking about suppress, uh, which is a, a herbicide, oh, sorry, sorry, an already registered herbicide in California um, from Westbridge. Uh, in 2019, we did some field testing um, on a type three field the efficacy was okay in 2019. Um, and we believe that perhaps we sprayed a little bit too close to heading. Uh, in 2020, we did some additional uh, testing in, in the field again with multiple weedy rice types. Efficacy appears good. Uh, it was applied before heading. So a little bit earlier than we did the application in 2020 or 2019. Uh, this year we also did some greenhouse testing at two different timings and this was all of the different weedy rice types um, in the greenhouse and it did it did actually look pretty good in the greenhouse so efficacy was 100% in the greenhouse on the biotypes that we tested which were uh, biotypes 1, 2, 3, and 5 and we did an earlier and a later testing uh, to kind of simulate what folks might be doing in the field and it looked quite good. So the data will be passed to Westbridge. And I'll just uh, remind everybody that um, at this point in time, the label does not allow for application when there's standing water on the field. So this is looking like a very good option for us. But again, it has to be applied when the field is drained. Um, again, maybe that will be changed by next year. I'm not sure. Uh, we'll have to um, see if the label, if we can get a label amendment. I'm not, I'm not positive about that. But at least we know that it does work, um, but again, with that caveat that the field has to be drained. Uh, so just to take a look at what it looked like. So in 2019, um, we did see pretty good efficacy, um, but the plants did go on to recover and there were some viable seeds in the, in the seed heads, in the panicles. Um, so again, the timing perhaps was too late. So we'll have to do an earlier timing uh, if we want to use this in the field. Uh, this was 2020. This was a week after spring and the application timing, uh, this timing really looked pretty good. The plants uh, we sprayed um, before they'd started to head and uh, by the end of the season none of the plants had survived. They completely died and none put out heads. So I think this timing is going to be the one that we'd probably go for. So it's when you can see the plants in the field, but they haven't begun to head. Uh, the other large experiment that we've been working on uh, with weedy rice is looking at overwintering. And this is uh, to see how weedy rice survives over the winter based on a couple of different uh, field conditions. Um, so the treatments that we've been doing, we've been doing this in, uh, in basins, basically um, swimming pools, actually, little like kid pools um, to simulate winter flooded conditions. Uh, so we did, we buried seeds types one, two, three, and five. And we also buried uh, M206 as a control, as a comparison. And then we did two depths, soil surface, and then six centimeters deep, the depth uh, at six centimeters was supposed to simulate tillage. So sort of no-till in the fall if you left them on the soil surface uh, versus six centimeters, which would simulate fall tillage. 
uh, we did a ambient weather, which is basically just leaving the, the you know, swimming pool to see what, um, uh, you know, what would be happening uh, with just sort of normal winter conditions and then flooded conditions. Um, they were removed from the soil at 30, 60, and 90 days after burial. And then we evaluated them for germination rate, dormancy and viability or death after we removed them from the soil. Okay, I'm not gonna go over all the different types, but I'm just kind of looking at um, what is happening over the, the 90 days um, that they were in the soil. Um, so 30, 60, and 90 days after burial, um, this was the average percent of dormant seeds. And I kind of just wanted to go over this type or this particular um, uh, evaluation real quick. So basically, um, overall, when seeds are buried under the ground, there's dormancy. So meaning that um, they, if, if you reflooded your field in the spring, if you had tilled in the fall, and you flooded your field in the spring, um, most of the seeds wouldn't come up, okay, if you had done tillage. So in this case with type one, we're inducing dormancy to about 16% um, of the seeds. So about 16% of the seeds wouldn't germinate. And this, you know, you might be asking why this is bad. Basically it's bad because uh, it's gonna pro prolong the length of time that those seeds are in the field. So if the more of the seeds are dormant, they're gonna be in that field for a much longer time. They're not gonna germinate that first year. They might germinate 10 years from now um, when they're brought closer to the, the soil surface again. Um, the other thing about this though, is that burial also seems to endure or to encourage seed death. Okay, so we are having, we're seeing seed death um, with field with a little bit of tillage in the fall, but also increased dormancy. So we'll be repeating this this year and we'll kind of see how these two things uh, interact a little bit more. Um, but you can see 30, 60 and 90 days uh, after burial, um, we're seeing an increase in seed death, okay. Uh, in our buried seeds. So increase over time to up to about 60%. So, and again, last year, it, the, there wasn't a lot of rainfall, but there was some. This year is looking like it might be a little bit drier. So maybe we'll see some more differences between the two treatments. Okay, uh, just to, to quickly go over, there are a lot of differences between the biotypes. So um, this slide is a bit busy, um, but just to, to kind of give folks an idea, um, there are some biotype differences. So I'll be you know, trying to summarize the data along with some of the data that we get this year, um, next, next fall, to, to give everyone a little bit more of a conclusive idea of what, what the differences are. We might have different recommendations uh, for some of the types versus others. So for type five, um, and this corresponds pretty well with what we're seeing in the field. So type five, um, there is, is no dormancy. This, this particular type isn't a dormant uh, wheaty rice. So basically uh, any sort of um, uh, fall tillage is actually gonna be an improvement in control for type five. So tilling in the fall for type five would be recommended because it doesn't have any dormancy. For the other types, uh, tilling in the fall, you can kind of see this is the tillage in gray uh, here. Uh, tilling in the fall is actually going to induce more dormancy and again, may prolong the amount of time that, you, that you're having these seeds in the field. So for type one and type two, uh, fall tillage is probably not gonna be a recommendation. Uh, these were the seeds, uh, the previous screen was the seeds that were in the flooded conditions. Uh, these are seeds that are in uh, actually controlled or ambient conditions. And I think the biggest difference here is with type five. So we've been recommending flooding uh, up to this point in time. And again, this is preliminary data. This is just one year's worth of data, but it's looking like with type five, 
actually burial and no flooding of the field is going to kill the largest percentage of seeds. So this, this in here in yellow is the number of seeds that, that died over the winter. Uh, this was in a non-flooded, fall-tilled field. So this is 81% of the seeds actually died under these conditions. So that in that case, doing that would actually be probably one of the quickest ways to get weedy, this type of white, weedy rice out of your field. So again, there's quite a lot of um, differences between the biotypes. And again, this is preliminary data, but I think it's going to give us some interesting, uh, you know, ideas of how to deal with weedy rice over the winter, especially if someone has a bad infestation, this might actually be um, a really great way to, uh, to deal with weedy rice. Okay, so for preliminary results of this, again, we're repeating this uh, a second time. Um, so generally, length of time that the seeds are in the field, longer time equals more seed death. So over, you know, making sure that you're harvesting and doing all of your field prep pretty much as early as you can in the fall in those weedy rice fields. And then if you can delay planting in those fields in the spring, that might also help to kill a few more seeds. Um, again, there's some significant differences between our biotypes and more data, more specific data on that will come, be coming next year. And then the last important point is that burial at six centimeters induces dormancy in some of our types. So basically type one, type two, type three, um, dormancy is induced by, by any sort of fall tillage. So possibly lengthening time in the field. But there is a trade-off, and again, we'll have to kind of tease out how these two things interact. Um, it appears also to increase seed mortality or seed death. So some interesting data, I think, and more to come next year. And I think that's the end for me. So um, I have got a few minutes for questions, and we'll also do the poll. Okay, Whitney, you had one question in the chat. Oh, I'll let you do the poll first. Okay. Uh, maybe I can, or do you want me to answer it while, while the poll's running or? Sure, if you want to, you can. I can, uh, Michael Horak asked, how are the infested acres estimated? Is the whole field counted or just the part of the field where the weed is present? All right, good question. So actually that was part of the reason we, we did this survey, like bigger survey this year. So in the past, we've been counting uh, acres as basically if we found even one weedy rice plant in, in the field, or I think we were doing it by check before. So if you found, if we found one weedy rice plant in a check, that entire check would be counted on the map as acreage. Um, for uh, this survey that we did over the summer this past year, we actually um, made a scale. And Luis, you can jump in if you want to add anything here. But we made a rating scale, basically, if the field had, um, you know, one plant versus sixty percent of the field being being infested, those would be uh, accounted for on the map. And we did it by check this year as well, so that each individual check in the field was surveyed separately for infestation level. So the data that we got this past year will be much improved versus the data that we have uh, from the past four years. So hopefully that entered the question. Okay, and you have another question. What rate okay. and water volume of suppress? Oh, okay, so I actually went with the highest labeled rate on, on, on the label and I can't remember the exact labeled rate, but whatever was the highest labeled rate allowed. Um, for water volume, I did 20 gallons per acre, and it, it was done with a backpack, so, you know, a backpack volume. Okay, that's all the questions I see for now, but feel free to type your okay. questions into the chat, and Whitney can answer as the webinar progresses as well, and be sure to fill out the poll. Okay, it looks okay. like most people have answered, but... Go ahead, sorry, Sarah. No, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, it looks like most folks have answered. If everyone who hasn't answered wants to real quick give an answer. 
remember this this part doesn't count doesn't matter if you get it wrong or right but it counts that you participated in the poll for your ce credits okay we'll give everybody maybe 10 seconds more and then we'll end the poll Okay. All right. So it looks like folks did pretty well. So preliminary data about the new watergrass species biotype suggest um, that it's both A and B. So it typically isn't controlled by early into the water granular herbicides. And it, it typically, when propanol and clincher are applied early, they appear to have efficacy. Um, and then question number two, fall tillage induces dormancy of weedy rice. That is true. Um, and that's it. So good job, folks. And again, those those questions will be shown in your after um, your test that you have to take after this. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much, Whitney. We are going to now have Luis Espino talk about rice pest management updates. So Luis, if you want to share your slides. Hey, um, good morning, everyone. And uh, thanks for attending today. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, here, if I can advance my slide. Uh, basically, a couple of updates on uh, one on, on armyworms. A little bit of uh, work that we've done this uh, this year, uh, looking at uh, insecticides and then the effect of defoliation on plants. And then I'll spend most of the talk um, on rice diseases. A very, uh, I'll try to give a quick um, update or, or a quick background information on on the main diseases that we see on rice fields. And then uh, I have some information on uh, some fungicide work that, that I've done this year. Um, OK, so I'll, I'll start with the armyworms. So we didn't have a lot of problems this year. Uh, in general, it seemed like the armyworm pressure was, was low, uh, maybe moderate. I know there, there was quite a bit of uh, intrepid use. Um, and maybe that's why we're not seeing the problems because you know we're controlling the issue. Um, but uh, we continue doing our uh, moth trapping. Um, so you may know that we have this uh, set of traps. Uh, we have 15 traps in different uh, sites across the valley, and we check them weekly and, and we uh, we count the number of moths that we get. And that that graph you see there is the number of moths per day. And what you can see is we have two distinct peaks. And for three years now, we've seen the same pattern where we get one peak, uh, you know, about late June, early July. And then the next one is in mid August. And those peaks coincide with when we see larvae in the field uh, feeding and, and kind of the peak of, uh, of the, the, uh, the problems in the field. Um, so we've done a lot of uh, monitoring and trying to count larvae and try to correlate that to, to the number of moths we're getting. And we just don't have a good relationship between how many moths you get on a, on a trap versus how many uh, worms there are in the field. But what we do see is, like I said, the peak of the moth uh, catches gives us the peak larval activity in the field. So if you know when you're, you're re reaching or approaching the peak, uh, you, you know, that's when you need to make sure you're monitoring, which as you see is about the same time every year. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a good reminder of when is it that you have to be on top of this and, and making sure you're getting in the field and looking for the larvae. Um, so we've always talked about two, two species of armyworms uh, that we can find on rice, you know, the true armyworm and then the Western yellow striped armyworm. And over the years, I've, I've heard um, growers and PCAs kind of refer to both of them as, as being in rice. Uh, so since the outbreak of 2015, you know, we've been monitoring closely rice fields. 
Uh, and last year and the year before that, so oh, this year, I'm sorry, 2020 and 2019 was the first year that I was finding some Western yellow striped army ones. Uh, but uh, the, this, the Westerns, I wasn't finding them eating on the rice. Uh, they've been feeding on rice weeds. So that picture there, you can see the Western yellow stripe is feeding on, um, on red berry. And there was a real big patch of red berry in this field, in this field and the, uh, the, the Westerns were just uh, uh, hitting that and defoliating the, the red berry. But they were not feeding on the rice. And I haven't seen any defoliation on rice caused by the Western yellow striped army one. And so, um, you know, the, it, it seems um, the, the, the data seems to indicate or the observations that really the, the army worm that's a problem for us is a true army worm. Uh, so if you, you know, if you happen to see the Western yellow striped army worm is much darker. Uh, it's about the same size as the true army worm as it grows, uh, but it has this velvety look, you know, and, and, and feeling like if you touch it, it's, it's really soft. It's a really, it's really pretty. And it doesn't, it doesn't seem to feed on rice. So that's good. So that's, if you find that, that's something that you might not have to worry about, um, about treating. Now this year, um, we, I got a, a, a notice from uh, the Ag Commissioner, one of the Ag Commissioner biologists in Glen County, and they were seeing some, uh, some Western yellow striped army worm uh, migrating from an alfalfa field. And they were getting complaints from uh, some of the neighbors, they were getting into the houses. So it was a big migration and I, I didn't get there that day, but I got there like a day or two later. And I was able to see the Westerns, you know, on the alfalfa field, there were quite a few defoliating, but then they were moving out of the field. And as they moved, they, they were um, defoliating, eating the weeds. I don't know if you can see that the, the army worms there, they're barely, they're, they're basically on stalks because they ate all the foliage of the weeds around the field. And then they were moving out of the field. They went over a canal. They, I guess, they swam, and then they went um, uh, over the uh, the pavement into the road. And they were moving to to neighboring fields, uh, probably into the weeds because there was nothing really. It was uh, it was orchards, so there was no rice around this area. But this was very interesting to see how uh, you know the pat the the behavior of the army worms. You know that's why we call them army worms because they move sort of like an army. Uh, but again, not on rice. So that's good to know. Um, we had an army worm uh, insecticide trial, and this was on a rice field with uh, some heavy defoliation, but not enough to, to warrant a treatment. Um, as you know, we've been getting intrepid uh, every year as a section 18, and a full registration is on the works. It might be um, uh, 2020 two when we get it, I'm not sure yet, but, um, and we're hoping to get it again in 2021. Um, and so we had Intrepid in our trial. Uh, we had Prevathon, which is Chlorantra Niliprol. Uh, that's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a product that's not registered on rice right now. We've tried it in the past and it's worked, it's worked good. And we're hoping that it becomes available sometime in the future. Uh, and then we tried the PEL, which is a BT, so it's an organic insecticide, a, a bacterial insecticide. We didn't include uh, Lambda uh, or, or Warrior because we've, we've tested it several times in the past and we don't get good control with Warrior. And in fact, we, we didn't include it in this trial, but we had another trial right next to it uh, where we were testing a, uh, an additive. So we were testing the Lambda with an additive to see if we could increase the efficacy of, of the lambda and it just it didn't work. Uh, we, we saw no differences with the untreated. But anyway, so on this trial though, uh, you know we we counted the number of worms we could find in a, during two minutes uh, for every plot. And so we did that at, at zero. So before we put out the treatments, four, six and 11 days after the treatments. And here's the number to look at is the percent reduction from, from the pre-treatment. And uh, you know, Intrepid and Prevathon give us really good control over 90%. That's what we've seen in the past. The PEL didn't get to 50%, and that's what we also have seen before. 
um, you know, when we put this treatment, it's about the time when you start seeing the defoliation. So the worms are already past the initial instars. They're a little, they're bigger. Uh, and so they're not, the pell is just not as effective as it is when, when you treat really small worms. But then uh, something very interesting we did this, um, this year is we went back, we left the plots in place, and then, then we came back at heading. So about 30, uh, I'm sorry, about 60 days after we put our original treatments. We didn't do any more treatments. We just came back and then we assessed how many panicles were injured by armyworm during heading. And it was, it was really clear there, uh, that there was a residual effect of the intrepid and the prevathon, where we saw you know, very few injured panicles, uh, where we didn't have the, the control early on with the pail and the untreated. Uh, there were uh, you know, much, much higher number of injured panicles. Um, so there is a residual effect. Uh, we're kind of thinking about how is this happening? Uh, we know, for instance, with Intrepid, we have some information from the manufacturer that we, you know, the residual that we usually see uh, is, is 20 days, uh, which is a very good residual. But um, I, I don't think what we're seeing is, is that the product still on, on the leaves as the armyworms um, are, are feeding on, on the panicles. Um, it, it might be that we're catching the very early instars uh, that get that, that emerge from eggs that get laid late, and those are the ones that are going to produce uh, panicle injury. So we're not sure how we're getting this this residual effect, but we're getting it. Um, it this is this is a, a benefit, and so we're going to probably look at this again um, next year to to confirm and see if we get the same effect. Um, so we've done some artificial defoliation trials. And why we do artificial, it's because, uh, you know, finding fields that are defoliated and, you know, untreated, it's, it's really difficult. Uh, and we do this at the Rice Experiment Station in Bix, and over there, we just don't get army worms. And so we just, uh, you know, we put our plots and then at the, at the army worm timing, we just go in and defoliate it manually. Defoliate, defoliate the, the, the plants manually with, uh, with shoot, pruning shears. And um, so we defoliate to uh, three, de three levels. So, you know, we get a plant height and then we defoliate 25% of that, 50% or 100%. And we, we do it through a period of three days to kind of mimic, you know, the army one doesn't fit on everything in one day, you know, it takes a little bit of time. And then this year we, we had three varieties, uh, M105, 206, and 401. And we wanted to see if there was maybe some differences on how the varieties respond to armyworm damage. And maybe uh, M105 can recover faster, uh, or maybe M401 take, you know, doesn't, it's affected more than other varieties. So uh, we, we looked at that. And uh, in, in, in conclusion, really, we didn't see a difference on, on how the varieties respond. They all respond about the same. And what we see is that the plant height is affected. Uh, the the uh, plants that get defoliated 100% and 50% are, are shorter, and they are never really able to catch up. 25% uh, they catch up, they, they recover. And the other uh, aspect that gets affected is panicle size. So uh, we get shorter panicles when we get defoliation of 50 and 100% of the foliage. Um, we didn't see an effect on uh, uh, how heading progressed or on number of panicles per square foot. Those seem to be unaffected. So the plants are able to put the same number of uh, panicles per square foot um, and about at the same time as, as, the, uh, as the controls. But the panicles are smaller, the plants are smaller. And then we saw an effect on yield. And when we have 25% defoliation, we don't see any, any yield effect. Uh, but when we got to 50% uh, and 100% defoliation, we get a, a yield effect. And so very small at 50%, 4% yield loss, and 26% yield loss, 
when we defoliate 100%. And when I say 100%, this is to the water level. So we cut everything to the water level, just like the army one would do. They, they eat everything and they, they leave a little bit of the tiller up above the water. Um, so this is kind of indicating that our thresholds that we currently use, 25% is our threshold. It's, it's, a, good, it's a good threshold. Um, at that point, we shouldn't see any, any yield effects. It's when we go above 25%, 50% that we start seeing yield reductions. Okay, so now I'm gonna uh, move into uh, the diseases. Uh, and so I'm gonna start with stem rot. Uh, this is a disease that's pretty, pretty common. You'll find it in every rice field. Um, in recent years, I've, I've been getting more and more calls about stem rot. Uh, you know, when it's bad, you'll see something like this. You know, a lot of the tillers have these black uh, lesions at the water level. Uh, uh, later in the season, you see the white sporulation of the fungus. And what this causes is lodging. Um, and the, you know, the lodging looks a little different than uh, sometimes you see the fields that lodge and they're really flat. In this case, when you get stem rod lodging, uh, the, the plants tend to break down here at the water level. And so the, the, the lodging looks really not even, not uniform. You see a little, a little bumps in the field. Uh, then you get a lot of blanking. Uh, you know, you're not getting the movement of nutrients uh, from the different parts of the plant into the kernels. So you're not filling all the kernels. So you get quite a bit of blanking. And then later in the season, if you uh, split up one of the tillers that are affected and look inside, you'll see this black, um, this black kind of like sand. And what those are, are the resting structures of the pathogen. They're called sclerotia. And they play a very important role in the disease because as these sclerotia accumulate, um, you get more disease uh, every year. And uh, uh, nutrient management also plays a role in, in this disease. So you'll get more stem rot if you have excess nitrogen and al also if you get a low uh, levels of potassium. Um, so and as a reference here, um, the, on, a soil, on a soil test, uh, you're looking at 120 ppms at your, as your threshold. So if you're below that on potassium, you might not see a deficiency in the field, uh, but it might uh, be uh, providing favorable conditions for stem rod development. Uh, you can get yield reduction, um, and we've, we've seen that in some of our trials. And so management is really a lot about uh, residue management. So you wanna make sure that you're de decomposing uh, this, this straw. Uh, the, the sclerotia survive in the straw and so if, this, if the straw is removed or burnt, then you're getting rid of, of, of the fungus. Uh, if, it's, uh, if the field is winter flooded, that helps as well because you're degrading that, that straw and that, um, that is gonna also re, uh, kill, kill the fungus. Uh, on, on a year like this, where we have a lot of straw out there and there's, you know, a lot of fields are dry, it's warm, that's, those sclerotia can germinate and produce more sclerotia. So it, these are favorable, favorable conditions for, uh, for the pathogen. So residue management, um, it's, it's key. Uh, nitrogen and potassium fertility, you know, use nitrogen to maximize yields. Don't, don't go over that. So you have to know your field. You have to know what is the nitrogen level that's gonna get you your, your top yield and assess the need for any top dressing. And like I said, potassium, Take a soil samples, check, check your, um, your potassium levels. And then you, there's fungicides that, that can be used. And we've been doing uh, trials for a few years now. And we see um, Quadris, you know, active ingredient as oxystrobin, gives us control, gives us, uh, reduces the disease severity. So this is a trial from this year. And we had Quadris at a couple of times. Uh, we, have, we sprayed quadris at the boot stage and then at the early heading stage. And these are really close in time. Um, the the mid-boot stage, uh, it's when we have a, a, a panicle of about four inches inside the boot. 
And then the early heading is about 10 days later. So they're really close in time, but we wanted to have the boot, the boot timing because we're having some uh, growers that have problems with SMUT. And so for SMUT, uh, the timing of application is at the boot stage. And so if, if we target that stage, can we get, um, uh, you know, if we target SMUT, can we save an application by including our stem rod or an aggregate sheet spot timing uh, sprays at that time? And looks like we get, you know, we get good control or similar control as, as we get when we uh, do our treatments at the early heading stage. We've done several, several years um, testing uh, the, uh, the propanil timing about, you know, 35 to 45 days after seeding, because that was a timing uh, that a lot of, lot of growers were uh, taking advantage of that propanil application to add uh, a fungicide in there. And we don't get, we haven't seen uh, good results uh, putting a fungicide on stem rod or aggregate sheet spot. So we added another, we, or we tested another uh, fungicide that's registered for rice, Stratego. It's a similar active ingredient as uh, Quadris. It's, uh, it, it's within the same group uh, as Trifloxystrobin. Um, and we did not see as good, um, has good results. So there's a little bit of a reduction in disease severity, but, but not, not as good as with quadris. And then we tested a, an organic uh, product um, and you know organic growers really don't have anything uh, that they can use. So we're, we've been looking for the past few years, uh, but this, this product did not work. Aggregate sheet spot is, is the other disease that um, is very similar to stem rot. It affects the tillers. So you early in the season, you, you'll start seeing these lesions. They're kind of gray, uh, gray green, and they have a, a very uh, distinct border to them. And what happens is these lesions start uh, moving up the plant. And as they move up, they, they affect the leaf sheath. And then the, the leaf, blade um, starts uh, first, they, it turns yellow, and then eventually it'll die. And so it takes, it takes foliage, it, you know, it, it kills leaves, and that can result in, in yield reduction. And if it, if it gets very severe, it'll go up to the panicle. I haven't seen that on, in, in the past uh, five years or so that I've been uh, working on, on rice diseases, uh, but, but it, it, can get, it can get severe. And then it produces the same uh, similar structures uh, that we call sclerotia. Uh, they're a little different. They're not black, they're brown. And again, it's similar to stem rot, goes back in, those sclerotia go back into the soil. And then as, as you accumulate sclerotia, the disease starts getting worse and worse. Um, so this disease is very uh, sensitive to potassium. So if you have low potassium levels, uh, you're probably gonna see uh, aggregation cheese spot. And, you know, you might not need a fungicide. All you need to do is bring up the potassium levels back to normal, back to, back to optimum, and you will see the disease go away. We've seen yield reductions. Um, and so management, it, again, residue management so that you don't accumulate those sclerotia, um, making sure you have adequate potassium in the soil, and then fungicides. And we've been testing fungicides for this disease also uh, for, for quite several years now. And uh, again, we, we tested two timings, uh, the boot stage and the heading stage, trying to see if uh, you know, we could save on application costs, thinking of uh, kernel smut. And Quadris gives us good, good disease reduction at both timings. Um, Excalia, which is a new fungicide, it's not registered yet, but it's going to be available hopefully in the next year or two. Uh, it's a different uh, fungicide, it's a different mode of action, different active ingredient, and it's excellent on this disease. Uh, unfortunately, it's the only disease that has a really good effect on, but it's, it's really excellent. And it's just used at two ounces per acre. Um, and then Quilt Excel. Quilt Excel is a mix of um, quadris and tilt, so um, asoxystrobin and propiconazole, and it has the same amount of asoxystrobin as quadris, and so it gives us very similar control as, as quadris. 
And then we saw a yield effect here, uh, averaging out the, the yield uh, increase on, on these treatments where we saw uh, disease reduction, we were gaining uh, 650 pounds to the acre. So a 7% yield increase. So this, this was a very good trial. Um, kernel smut, it's uh, another disease that um, we've been seeing lately. It was first uh, seen in California in 19, mid 1980s and really uh, hasn't, it didn't give problems or it didn't cause any problems for a few years until maybe the mid 2010s when I started to hear concerns from PCAs asking me, what is this kernel smut? Um, you know, we see it more and more. It didn't seem to be causing any issues at that time. But 2018 was really bad. 2017 was bad too. And what it does is replaces the kernel with this uh, mass of spores, you know, and it can be partial or it can be the whole kernel. Um, the, so uh, we get spores that are in the seed or it can be in the soil. And we don't understand the cycle of the disease very well. But um, the, the, the pathogen is favored by excess nitrogen and high humidity. So whenever we have, 2018 was a year where we had the fires early, you know, a little earlier than this year. And that might've been a factor, you know, uh, providing more, more dew, more humidity during the, during the uh, late part of the season. There's an effect on yield and grain quality. We, we had some trials this year where we saw a strong effect on yield. And so management is making sure you're using the amount of nitrogen that you need to, uh, to maximize your yield and don't go over that. There's some uh, effect of uh, which variety you have and then fungicides. And I have some slides on that. So here's the, the, the SMUD on different varieties. So this is the number of SMUDed kernels in 25 grams. It's a sample we take at, at harvest uh, and about what, what we, we see in general and what we've seen over the years is that the medium grains are less susceptible than the long grains. And then the short grains are um, even less susceptible. Um, you can see that with uh, Calhicari 202, uh, we didn't have much smut. Uh, S202 had quite a bit in this trial, but in other trials we've seen some short grains have very little smut. And then out of the medium grains, 209 always seems to be the one that has the more the, mo the most smut. Uh, a long grain here, L207, had the, the highest level of smut. But uh, L208, you know, another long grain, doesn't seem to be as susceptible. Uh, talking to the breeders, they tell me that they both have very similar genetics. Um, so uh, the reason why they're different, um, it's, it's not totally clear. Uh, then uh, we had a trial looking at the effect of nitrogen, and I'm just showing here uh, the, uh, the untreated plots. And so uh, we had, a, this is with a A201, an aromatic long grain. And we had a, a, a nitrogen level of 150 pounds, and then a nitrogen level of 170 pounds. And just adding those extra 20 pounds increased the level of SMUD almost twofold. So we got almost double the SMUD just by adding that extra nitrogen and we didn't get any benefit on yield. So very important to go with your, with your nitrogen rate that you know maximizes yield and don't go over that. Um, on the fungicides here, uh, tilt and quilt excel gave us uh, disease reduction. So tilt is propiconazole, quilt excel has propiconazole and that seems to be what's doing the work here. We tried other fungicides, some organic fungicides. One of them had a little bit of an effect, uh, but, but not much really. And um, there was a question about smut and, and in the seed and is bleach helping us? You know, we do this, this uh, bleach soak of the seed. Is, does that have any effect on the smut spores? Uh, so we did a trial with, uh, in collaboration with Texas A&M and uh, the short is no, it doesn't seem to help. So we don't get any reduction in spore germination if we treat our seed with, with bleach. So actually in this, in this experiment, we saw more smut germination when we treat the, the, the seed with bleach. 
Um, so it doesn't seem that the bleach does anything for us. I just have two more slides. And I wanted to talk about BLAST real quick. BLAST was bad this year, uh, especially on the north part of the valley. Uh, you know, we can get leaf blast, uh, panicle blast, which is the, the, the face of the disease that, that causes the most problems. Um, you know, I'm not going to go over much detail. I think all of us are, are pretty um, uh, familiar with blast by now. But I did want to mention that um, when it comes to varieties, you know, this year, M205 and M209 was, were just terrible with blast. We're, you know, PCAs were doing two applications and still the blast was coming, uh, go, you know, was, was still affecting the, the field. So uh, many, many times I brought up M210. It's a resistant variety, uh, but I got a lot of questions about, you know, how it, how it behaves. And so I wanted to show this, um, this table here. M210 is really an, an M206 with blast resistance. And so this is four years of data from our statewide variety trials. And really yields are the same as M206, uh, days to 50% heading, uh, plant height, lodging, it's, it's basically, they're basically the same. So, um, you know, if you're in one of these areas uh, up in Glen County, Colusa, Butte County, where, where you see blast um, regularly, uh, this variety would be a good option. I mean, you wouldn't have to worry about blast. It, this variety is, is resistant. And that's my last slide. I think now um, Sarah or um, Renee, that we're going to launch the questions. And sometimes it takes a little bit of time. And so I, I have three questions. So make sure you scroll on the on the little screen. Um, so the first question is, true armyworm is highly susceptible to pyrethroid insecticides. Is that true or false? I think we, we talked about that. Uh, the second question is, the best fungicide application timing for management of stem rot and aggregate schist spot is propanil time, mid boot, early heading, or both mid boot or early heading. And then the third question is, um, which macronutrient can increase the severity of kernel smut? Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, or calcium? And so I'll let you guys think about this for a few minutes. We got 40% of you have answered. Remember, you don't have to get it right. Um, you just have to answer to kind of prove that you were awake um, and still sitting in your chair. But um, this will be good practice for the final, for the actual test that you have to take uh, to get your your credits for DPR. And we got now 60, 70% of you answered. We're getting there. Remember to scroll down so you see question number three. We'll give it another one more minute. Let everybody answer the questions. Well, while we do that, I, I, you know, I was going to mention, I wasn't sure if I was going to have time. You know, when I talked about potassium and aggregate she spot, um, I had a field this year where we had set up a trial and it had just terrible, terrible aggregate she spot. And so we took leaf samples to see what was the potassium level. And we were getting, uh, I mean, 0.2, 0.3%. And the optimum is 1.5%. So we were way below the, the optimum potassium level. And that's why we were seeing such, such you know, uh, severe disease in that field. So you know, I'm, we're gonna talk to the grower and make sure they address that. And I'm sure addressing that potassium is gonna go a long ways in fixing the, the disease issue. So we're at 86%. Um, we got one minute. So I'm just going to end the poll. 
now so we can look at the results. Okay, so true armyworm is highly susceptible to pyrethroid insecticides. So that is false. Um, we just don't get good levels of control with, with pyrethroids. Even when we treat early to try to catch the small worms, we just don't get good control. Uh, we tried uh, piperonyl butoxide, which synergizes the, uh, the, the pyrethroid, and uh, it, it just didn't work. Um, the best fungicide application timing for management of stem rot and aggregate cheese bud. It seems to be the mid boot or er early heading. So at those times when we uh, use a fungicide, we seem to get the best response. Uh, propanil time we've, I think last year, um, I counted out of 18 trials, we saw good results with propanil at propanil time in one trial. So in general, propanil time is just not um, the right time to put fungicides. Um, and then what macronutrients can increase the severity of kernel smut? And yes, it's nitrogen. Nitrogen, just a little bit of extra nitrogen, uh, you know, as, as shown uh, by the trial this year, can really uh, make a big difference in, into how much smut you get. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm almost out of time, but um, if there are questions, I'll be happy to address. Yeah, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat for Luis and he can answer them during the break. Thanks. Okay, thanks everybody. With that, we're gonna take a 10 minute break. Um, please do not log out during the break. Talks resume at 10.15. See you then, thank you. So yeah, so there was a question about uh, the answer for number two, the, that was the fungicide timing. So the, the best timings uh, are at the, for stem rot and aggregate she spot seem to be at the mid boot and early heading or early heading stage. Uh, those seem to give us good disease reduction.
Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started here in one minute. Amber, if you wanna get your slides launched, we can get started in. Yeah, I just, uh, here we go. Um, I need you to stop sharing, there we go. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. Yep. Okay. All right, do you want me to get started, Sarah? That would be great. Our next presenter is Amber Van Casey Vall, UCCE Veg Crops Advisor, and she's going to be talking about integrated pest management of processing tomatoes. Thanks, Amber. Great. Thank you, Sarah. So yeah, today I'll be talking about IPM of processing tomatoes with a focus on the Sacramento Valley. And first, I want to start off with an overview of IPM. So integrated pest management is an ecosystem-based strategy focusing on long-term prevention of pests and damage through a combination of techniques. These can include biological, cultural, and chemical controls working together. Pesticides are used only after monitoring indicates that they're needed, and treatments are made with the goal of removing only the targeted organism. Materials are selected and applied in a manner that minimizes risks to human health, beneficial and non-target organisms, and to the environment. I also want to briefly mention that myself and colleagues from Cooperative Extension and UCIPM are developing a pest management strategic plan for processing tomatoes. This is funded by the Western IPM Center. It's a planning document that details pest management issues and management practices in a particular crop, and the input for this document is directly from stakeholders. So we held two meetings, both for the northern region and the southern region um, processing tomato growing regions, and we held these in 2019. And it's essentially a needs assessment that lists priority research, regulatory, and education needs for California processing tomato. And there's currently not one for processing tomatoes. And so we're expected to publish this in spring 2021. So be on the lookout for that. So an outline of what I'm going to be talking about today, um, the first part of the presentation will be on weeds. And I'll briefly discuss a cultivator trial that I conducted in 2020. Then we'll move on to diseases and mainly focus on soil-borne fungal pathogens, which are the biggest issues for tomatoes in the Sacramento Valley. Then very briefly talk about insects and um, resources for this talk are from UCIPM and most of the information can be found in the pest management guidelines for tomatoes. So we'll jump right into weed management. We'll start with post-harvest and pre-plant weed management. Um, so crop rotation can effectively reduce weed problems by changing the environment that favors a specific weed species or by allowing methods to control weeds that couldn't be used in a tomato crop. For example, corn allows for the use of herbicides to control night, nightshades, yellow nutsedge, and field bindweed that you wouldn't be able to use um, in tomatoes. Other useful rotational crops include wheat, cotton, rice, dry beans, onions, carrots, and safflower. But it's not recommended to rotate with solanaceous crops like potatoes, peppers, and eggplant because they're very cl closely related to tomatoes and will have very similar weed issues. Uh, field preparation, of course, avoiding fields with severe weed infestations if possible. Avoid moving weed seed into fields on equipment or clean equipment before entering clean fields. Deep tilling can reduce nightshade and nutsedge problems. And pre-irrigation rainfall can germinate nightshade species before planting for control with cultivation or with post-emergence herbicides. So um, more post-harvest and pre-plant management. Soil fumigation with metam sodium and metam potassium can provide control of many weeds and other soil borne pests, but you'll want to make sure to leave enough time between the fumigant application and transplanting to prevent any phytotoxicity. Herbicides, of course, are um, great weed management tools. Herbicide applications made to fall or winter beds can allow for early plantings that you wouldn't otherwise be able to cultivate because of wet soil conditions. Rainfall is necessary to break down any fall applied herbicides so that the following year's tomatoes won't be injured. Perennial weeds like field bindweed and little mallow can be controlled post-harvest by irrigating and applying contact herbicides. Some herbicides are best applied just before planting and incorporated into the soil. This is a common practice, at least in Calusa and Sutter counties where uh, treflan and dual magnum are used. The entire bed top can be treated or band treatments can be applied over the seed line. So these band treatments can reduce herbicide costs and the risk of herbicide carryover to the next crop. Post-emergence weed treatment may also be necessary before planting to control any weeds that have already emerged. At planting weed management, 
Um, manipulating planting dates, if possible, will allow you to take advantage of weed germination under different temperatures. For example, early plantings under cooler soil temperatures can usually avoid any barnyard grass competition uh, for young tomatoes. Transplanting, of course, which is pretty standard practice, gives the crop a growth advantage over weeds. And standard cultivation can further reduce weed populations along the side of the plant row. After planting, uh, cultural practices like preventing weeds from going to seed and keeping canal banks free of weeds can help a lot. Avoid, again, avoid moving weed seeds into the fields on equipment or clean your equipment before bringing it into the field. Keeping bed tops dry. Uh, this is easier to do with drip irrigation. Um, by keeping the bed tops dry, less weeds are likely to germinate on the soil surface, though perennial weeds like field bindweed are still likely to remain a problem under drip irrigation. With furrow irrigation, maintaining alternate row irrigation prevents overly wet conditions. For uh, cultivation and hand weeding, mechanical cultivation reduces hand weeding needs later. And in the Sacramento Valley, um, in row cultivators like the finger weeders have been um, gaining popularity. And I'll talk a little bit about those when I get to my research trial. Also post-emergence herbicides apply as directed on each side of the seed line and immediately incorporate or you can do variable rate lay-by applications that will reduce your herbicide costs with no loss in weed control or tomato yield. So this would be applying full rate in the furrow and reduced rates next to the crop. Common weed problems in tomatoes are uh, field bindweed, nightshades, nut sedge. I'll talk a little bit about broom rape on the next slide. And all of this information can be found at the integrated weed management um, page with UCIPM. So broom rapes are root parasites. They attach to the host below ground and at high densities, they can greatly reduce yield or result in crop failure. So there's two species that we have in California, branched broom rape and Egyptian broom rape. Branched broom rape is A-listed. It's a pest of known economic or environmental detriment that is not known in California or is present in limited distribution that allows for the possibility of eradication or successful containment. It's subject to state enforced action involving eradication, quarantine, regulation, containment, rejection, or other holding action. Egyptian broom rape is a Q-listed pest. This is an organism or disorder suspected to be of economic or environmental detriment, but whose status is uncertain. And this is because of incomplete identification or inadequate information. Both species have been detected in conventional processing tomato fields. And in other countries, broom rape um, causes up to 70% loss in tomato. In California, currently, we're scouting, reporting, quarantining, and then crop destruct. Our short-term goal is to minimize spread. There's no current data on control of either broom rape species with any California registered pesticides. So there's a need to develop mitigation approaches to um, stop this. Hopefully this broom rape won't spread um, significantly around the state. And there, Brad Hansen, a weed specialist at UC Davis, and his grad students are um, doing some work on, on broom rape and pesticides as well. So I wanna talk about a trial that I conducted with my colleague, Scott Stoddard, down in Merced County this past year. We wanted to evaluate weed control time and costs of using automated and mechanical cultivators as part of a weed management program. So we compared these in-row mechanical and robotic weeders to standard grower practice and post-emergence herbicides. We had trial sites in both Calusa and Merced counties. So we used the Robovator thanks to a vegetable weed specialist in Salinas, Steve Fenimore, who allowed us to borrow his machine. It's an automated weeder that uses cameras and vision technology to differentiate between the tomato and weeds. And I'll show you this in videos on the next slide. And we also use the finger weeder, which I mentioned is gaining popularity in um, the Sacramento Valley. I know a few growers who have purchased them this past year. It's, uh, it uses uh, interlocking fingers to pull up weeds within the plant row. So we found that the Robovator provided good weed control in the Calusa field, but caused significant crop injury in the Merced field. And when I show you the video, you'll see how this could be possible if the machine is not calibrated correctly. The finger weeder provided excellent control in Merced and very good long-term control in the Calusa field, up to four weeks. And we were funded by the California Tomato Research Institute, and we're currently working on the final report, so some of that data will be shared in a newsletter coming out soon. Okay, so here's the Robovator, and you can see that the blades open around the tomato plant and then pull up weeds within the plant row. So if this wasn't calibrated correctly for spacing, 
um, you can see how it could also pull up tomato plants and cause crop injury. This is from the Calusa field where it worked really well. And then for the finger weeder, you can't really see it, but this is a five bed finger weeder that my grower collaborator purchased for 2020. And I just wanted to show how fast it can move through the field. Okay. Uh, and now we'll move on to uh, processing tomato diseases. This is a summary table of fields with the most common diseases that I saw in the last five years. These are just fields that I was called out to with confirmed, uh, confirmed results from the, from Cassandra Sweat's lab at Davis. She's our field and vegetable crops extension pathologist, um, or these were confirmed, um, with an Agdia immunostrip tests for bacterial canker, and then, um, double confirmed with her lab. So I'll be going through each of these in more detail. A lot of these diseases are wilts and crown rots, and they're very difficult to, to differentiate in the field. So I want to start with bacterial canker. There's two types of infections for bacterial canker, and I did see more of it in the field in 2020. Uh, systemic infections are where the bacteria invade the plant. The oldest leaflets will curl. You'll see poor growth and wilt, and cankers may form at the nodes. There also may be some stem cracking. The source for the systemic infection is generally seed and transplants, or it overwinters in plant residue in the field. Secondary infections is where bacteria cause local infections on the leaves, stem and the fruit. The margins of the leaves become infected. You'll see dark brown lesions like the photo of the foliage at the top here, uh, irregular leaf spotting, and you may even see the bird's eye spot on the fruit, which you can see in this picture as well. Uh, bacterial canker survives indefinitely on tomato tissue if it doesn't decompose. <clears throat> and certified seed will reduce your chances of infection and also using clean transplants. If you do identify this in the field, do not work the field when the foliage is wet. This is um, how secondary infections can spread from contaminated equipment, splashing water, and this will lead to localized infections. Also, be sure to turn under any infected plant residue so it can decompose at the end of the season. And it is recommended to rotate to another crop for at least one season if possible. Now I'll move on to our various fusarium problems in the Sacramento Valley. Fusarium crown and root rot or Fusarium oxysporum radicis lycopersicae is becoming more common and widespread. Uh, any stunted, wilted, or older plants may die. It can also look like tomato spotted wilt virus or alfalfa mosaic with the foliar symptoms. You'll see yellowing on the margin of the oldest leaves and then necrosis. The plant will slowly decline over many weeks. And it's. To, I wanted to note that the crown rot is a localized lesion on the plant. The stem will be brown on the outside and rotten on the inside. And you may often see the roots decaying as well. It overwinters and survives for many years in the soil as spores and is favored by cool soil temperatures and spread by machinery and transplants. There are some resistant and tolerant varieties available and I wanted to um, note that this photo is a field that was co-infected with Fusarium crown and root rot and root knot nematode. So those two together really brought these plants down. Fusarium falciformi, some of you may have heard of this and some may have not. This is a new problem. Uh, it's a stem and crown rot and leads to vine decline. You may see branch or whole plant chlorosis, deep leaf curling, deformities, and little leaves. The leaf speckling can lead to leaf death and then the whole plant dies. And these pictures are all from Cassandra Sweat and studies that she's done at uh, one of the UC Davis research farms. Not all foliar symptoms will develop in all cultivars. So those are not really things that we can rely on for a diagnosis. You wanna look for the foot, crown and stem rot. That'll help you differentiate between other fusarium diseases and uh, virus herbicide or salt damage. Those are the only consistent symptoms is that, is that foot, crown, stem rot. And that crown rot generally starts below the soil line. And you can see in these pictures how big this rot can get here on the crown. And there's still a lot to figure out about this disease. We've, it was found in Sutter County in 2019 and in Calusa County this past year in 2020. And of course, Fusarium wilt race three. If you grow tomatoes in the Sacramento Valley, you definitely know about this problem. This is a big disease issue. Uh, <clears throat> we see individual branches becoming yellow and wilting, and we call this the yellow flag effect, which you can see in this bottom photo here. You'll see internal dark brown discoloration that extends pretty far up the stem. We call this vascular discoloration. 
One thing to note is that it shows up later in the season compared to verticillium wilt. So you're unlikely to see fusarium wilt um, earlier than 45 days after transplanting. It's favored by warm weather, drought, stress, and a heavy fruit load. Infected plants will usually die and it can greatly reduce yields. It overwinters and survives for many years as spores in the soil and even on other plants without causing them harm. The sweat lab is doing, and her um, postdoc, Kelly, is doing a lot of work on fusarium wilt and crop rotations to see what effect fusarium wilt of tomato has on these crops that are commonly rotated with tomato. It's uh, spread by soil on machinery. Uh, management includes resistant varieties, which are great. Um, but again, if you have root knot nematodes, sometimes the resistance can be broken. And we're going to be hopefully looking into this, this relationship with these fusariums and root knot nematode in the future. Cleaning farm equipment, again, avoiding nematode infestations and rotating out of tomato for several years to reduce inoculum level. Verticillium wilt can easily be confused with fusarium wilt. Older and lower leaves are the most effective and it has a very wide host range. So you'll see these yellow V-shaped lesions um, that narrow from the margin on older leaves and then the plant will, the leaves will turn brown and die. You can see this V-shaped lesion on the bottom photo here. You'll also see that vascular discoloration, the light tan discoloration appearing in the tissue at the base of the plant. The fungus survives as microsclerotia in the soil and persists indefinitely. It's favored by cool soil and temperatures and it's usually an early season issue. Like I mentioned, if you see a wilting disease before, um, earlier than 45 days after planting, it's probably verticillium wilt and not fusarium wilt. It seldom kills plants, but will reduce vigor and yield. And management, again, sanitation and washing of equipment and rotating to non-host crops like corn and small grains to reduce inoculum. I wanna mention Southern blight because it's been um, becoming a bigger issue in Calusa County, especially over the past few years. It's a destructive crown rot disease that rapidly kills tomato plants and has over 500 plant hosts. It, um, these can include uh, sunflower, cucurbits, beans, many of the things that are commonly rotated with tomatoes. It persists year to year in crop debris and is favored by high temperatures, high soil moisture, dense canopies, and frequent irrigation. Southern blight may be around in your field, but it needs these perfect conditions to develop, so you might not see it every year. You'll see these small tan to reddish brown sclerotia form at the base of the plant or in the soil right around the plant. You can see them in this top photo. They're very small, um, small little brown spheres. And you can also see these white fan-like mycelium growing on the crown or into the soil. Um, it's hard to see these two symptoms in tomatoes. So if you think you might have Southern blight, um, we can take samples to Cassandra's lab and she'll grow it out on towels like these two pictures. So, and then you get those um, very clear symptoms. Plants go from healthy to dead in less than a week. It's a very rapid disease. And in the field, the disease patches will look roughly circular, kind of similar to the patchy distribution of root nematode infestations. And distinguishing the many different fusariums and these other crown rots and wilts like Southern blight and verticillium wilt, um, there's really no quick tests for these in the field. Um, we send samples to the sweat lab or, or you can send them to private labs for accurate diagnosis because all of these diseases have very similar symptoms. And I wanna talk about a study that we conducted in 2018, both myself, uh, agronomy advisor, Sarah Light, and then Cassandra Sweat, our extension pathologist. This was also funded by the California Tomato Research Institute. And we did this because the late planting dates and high temperatures from 2017 um, led to very favorable conditions for disease development. And we saw a lot of tomato fields and other um, like bean fields that had um, Southern blight in 2017, very severely. So we monitored nine fields that had confirmed Southern blight in 2017. We monitored them in 2018 to determine the sclerotia levels while the fields were planted to rotational crops like corn and sunflower. So we found that Southern blight sclerotia levels increased from the beginning of the season to the end of the season in all of the sunflower fields. It is a host of Southern blight, so we expected this. But for the corn fields, it stayed the same or decreased. So corn appears to be a better rotational crop for Southern blight than sunflower. And Cassandra has a postdoc in her lab um, developing a predictive model for Southern blight. And so we're hoping that this will help um, the growers in our area predict when, what year Southern blight will be, will be worse. 
And I want to talk about root knot nematode. I um, saw some issues with this this past year, again, with that complex of root knot nematode and these other crown rots or fusarium diseases. Root knot nematode causes galling of roots and these galls interfere with the flow of water and nutrients to the plant. The plants will yellow, wilt, and respond poorly to fertilizer. And like I said, they have a patchy distribution in the field. So you can check the roots of your plants mid-season or later, but check earlier if you see any above ground symptoms. Like your plants are going down earlier in the season and you're not sure why. You can dig some up and see if you find any galls. Damage is more likely in sandier soils. Managing weeds can help and using resistant varieties, though we have seen some um, resistance breaking in our area. Rotating with non-host crops, um, it also works well. So we're trying to look at this relationship between Renat nematode and fusariums and understand it a little better. Um, and I'll be working with Amanda Hodson, nematologist and at UC Davis and Cassandra Sweat, our extension pathologist. <clears throat> so I'm kind of moving into insects now, but it's this is kind of a crossover for insects and diseases. It's thrips and tomato spotted wilt virus. Tomato spotted wilt virus is vectored by thrips. Once acquired, the thrips can carry the disease for the rest of their life. It's acquired by immature thrips, but the adults are responsible for plant to plant transmission. The virus has a very wide host range, but luckily we do have an Agdia immuno strip kind of field test for tomato spotted wilt. So you can take a symptomatic leaf and crush it up in the little um, Agdia bag. And then it's kind of like a pregnancy test. You put the, the immuno strip in, into the liquid and it'll tell you positive or negative for tomato spotted wilt virus. This causes bronzing on the upper side of young leaves, which can lead to necrotic spots. And then you can also see the chlorotic spots on fruit and concentric rings, which is shown in this picture here. There's a great brochure on UCIPM and, and you can find it through the pest management guidelines for tomatoes. And it gives a lot of information on tomato spotted wilt virus. Uh, avoiding planting tomatoes next to onions, garlics, or cereals will help reduce your thrips pressure and planting resistant varieties is great as well. Though resistance, we're seeing resistance breaking in the Fresno area. As far as I know, it has not been found this far north and we're hoping it doesn't, doesn't show up. Um, managing thrips is also helpful using um, insecticides like spinetaram, which is radiant, spinosad, which is in trust, dinotefuran is venom, and then methamyl is lanate. Roguing infected plants at the seedling stage, controlling weeds, and removing and destroying old plants. Um, you wanna make sure that there's no virus reservoir for the thrips to feed on. So if you see an infected plant, if you can pull it out so the thrips can't feed on it and then spread the disease to, to more plants. Um, for thrips, treating with foliar sprays early in the season and as needed, um, throughout the season will help limit the spread of tomato spotted wilt as well. So I just want to briefly mention a few insect problems. Um, insects aren't generally a huge issue for tomato growers in the Sacramento Valley, but I just want to mention a few that can warrant control. A more exhaustive list and more information can be found in the pest management guidelines for tomatoes on the UCIPM website. So Aphids, like the green peach aphid and early season aphids, they may result in wilting, but they're usually not of great concern unless the crop is water stressed. They also vector alfalfa mosaic virus, so avoid planting next to alfalfa fields if possible. I have seen that in some fields. It's usually not of economic damage though, but it can look a lot like tomato spotted wilt virus. Um, Management natural enemies are usually pretty good about controlling early season aphids, um, but if not insecticides like Movento, Fulfill, and um, Neonix, uh, like Thiamethoxan, which is Actera or Platinum, Flonicamid, which is Belief, and then other Neonix like Acetamiprid and Imidacloprid, which are Assail and Admire Pro. Armyworms, um, in large numbers, they can attack foliage and fruit, creating irregular holes. These are usually superficial issues and you'll have little loss when you're processing the tomatoes for paste, but they can be cause more significant damage for whole pack or diced tomatoes. Natural enemies, again, are pretty good about controlling armyworms. Um, and then insecticides to use would be chlorantranilipril, which is corrigin, methoxyphenazide or intrepid as Luis mentioned in his talk, and then spinetaram, which is radiant. Russet mites, uh, infestations of this mite progress up the plant from the bottom. The lower leaves will dry out and then they'll frequently become bronze or russet colored, hence the name of the mite. Removing alternate hosts like nightshades and bindweed can be helpful to reduce russet mite problems and also applying sulfur. For stink bugs, uh, stink bugs are a much bigger problem down in Fresno County, but they cause dark pinpricks by their feeding 
And um, that may be surrounded by a light discolored area that then turns yellow. And they also may carry yeast or pathogens that can cause um, bigger problems and more fruit decay than just their feeding damage. Uh, to manage stink bugs, destroying weeds like legumes, blackberries, Russian thistle, mustards, and little mallow is helpful because those are great overwintering hosts for adults. So you can get rid of those areas for them. For wireworms, which I know can be a problem for certain growers in the area, wireworms are the immature stage of click beetles and they live in the soil and they can chew on and bore into the larger stems and roots of transplants. So management includes um, diazinon, clothianidin, or belay, imidacloprid, and acetamiprid, again, admire pro and assail, respectively. And just um, be sure to always follow label instructions for rates and timings for insecticides. And so with that, uh, thank you for listening. Um, if you'd like to subscribe to my newsletter, I post research updates and local pest information on vegetable crops in Calusa Sutter and Yuba counties. And at the, you can find the subscription uh, at the University of California Cooperative Extension Calusa County website under vegetable crops. And then I think with that, we'll launch the polls and I can take um, any questions. So I have three questions here for the polls. Uh, which of the following is not a post-harvest pre-plant weed management method? How can you manage Fusarium wilt race three in your tomato field? And Fusarium diseases and crown rots are difficult to distinguish from one another in the field. So I'll give you a few minutes to answer those. Thank you, Amber. And please post any questions for Amber in the chat. I see one question in the chat. Could onion, garlic, and cereals be used as trap crops when growing tomato crops? Um, potentially they could. If you were going to control those for thrips, I would be a little worried about thrips move very quickly and they're very small. So, um, but if you planted them kind of next to the tomatoes, I think certain thrips species would be more attracted to the garlic and onion than to the tomatoes, but you, do, you may be increasing your risk for tomato spotted wilt virus. I know we've looked at onion also as a rotational crop for um, southern blight because in tomatoes, you can't really spray any fungicides to control southern blight because of the tomato canopy. But with um, onions or uh, garlic, it's easier to get to the crown. So you'll still see southern, southern blight can also infect onion and garlic. So you, you have that risk, but it's easier to control because you can get to the soil and the crown of the plant where the southern blight microsclerotia are, are hanging out. Okay, we'll do another minute or so. 74% have answered the polls. Okay, do a few more seconds. Okay, let's share the results. Okay, so which of the following is not a post-harvest pre-plant weed management method? Transplanting is the correct answer. That is an at planting uh, weed management method. How can you manage fusarium wilt race three in your tomato? Oh great, 100% all of the above. Cleaning equipment, planting resistant varieties and rotating out of tomato, perfect. And then fusarium diseases and crown rots are difficult to distinguish from one another in the field. True. That is true. They all have very similar symptoms and accurate diagnosis in a lab is, is key to knowing which disease you have. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Our next speaker uh, is Sarah Light, our area agronomy advisor, and she'll be giving a pest management update on field crops. Thanks, Amber. So I'm going to be talking about um, some recent research in the Sacramento Valley on field crops. Some of this is research that I've worked on. Some is a work that Rachel Long has done. She's down in the Capital Corridor area. 
uh, Yolo, Sacramento, um, Solano County, and some is work that we've worked on together. You can see my email here, so please feel free to follow up with me with any questions. A quick reminder of resources, our Agronomy Resource Research and Information Center, AGRIC, has um, quite extensive resources on uh, field crop research and uh, information from UC researchers throughout the state. It's kind of our centralized hub. So please visit that first. You can also find points of contact for specific crops if you have questions, et cetera. Our UCIPM page here also has crop specific information. Um, this is my website that you can find through our CE Sutter Yuba, Sutter Yuba office and you can subscribe to my newsletter there. And then we have quite a lot of ANR specific blogs around uh, for specific crops um, and other topics that we keep really up to date. And sometimes that's the fastest way to get um, updates about pests that we've seen in the field. So uh, be sure to subscribe if you want to follow what's going on. Okay, so the first project I'm going to talk about is evaluating the efficacy of a preplant weed control in alfalfa. So in this trial, uh, there were basically, it was a, a split plot design. So pre-plant, there was either no treatment applied, tillage, or glyphosate. Um, and then in season, there was either no treatment or a raptor spray. And so we had the combination of both the pre-plant and in season for both. This is a plot with glyphosate applied pre-plant plus in season raptor. A uh, nice looking alfalfa stand um, here on the left where you see this kind of dry uh, gray strip. Um, that is one of the plots that had neither um, pre-plant or in season. And so it was very, very heavy in weeds. And then in the kind of foreground, um, you can see uh, again, a higher canopy. And that is uh, where the raptor was not implied in season. This is a close up of that. Plot. So this is glyphosate pre-plant, but no in-season herbicide. I also um, call this plot the, the area where you would hide your farm advisor body after they convince you to work on a project that results in a weedy alfalfa stand. So it was very, very tall weeds above my head. Uh, I took weed stand counts at different points throughout the growing season, but I'm just going to show this one date. Uh, the full report will be available on my website. So if you're interested in how the dynamics changed throughout the season, you can review that for more information. Um, so the top table is the percent cover of broadleaves at last weed count. So basically for this, I took out a quadrant that was a meter by meter and put it in a representative part of the field three times and then evaluated the percent cover of broadleaves, alfalfa, grasses, as well as bare soil. And for the treatments that had, uh, that had pre-plant treatments, um, so that's here on the left, and then the raptor in season or no is on the right. And so the ones that had no pre-plant treatment really had quite heavy broadleaf weed pressure, both uh, with and without the raptor control. Um, the glyphosate pre-plant and tillage pre-plant combined with the raptor resulted in very low percentage of broadleaves. Um, but when the glyphosate and the tillage were applied, um, pre-plant, but there was no in-season control, there was still a significant reduction in, in percent broad leaves as compared to uh, the no control plots. Uh, kind of the converse of that, the flip side is if you go and look at the bottom table, this is the percent cover between treatments that last weed count. Um, and it's sort of the reverse where there's more alfalfa here in the plots where the weeds were very effectively controlled by pre-plant and in-season application and the alfalfa was less percent of the of the cover when there was no in-season control. Uh, this is some yield data. And so uh, the plots were harvested with these meter by meter quadrants. And then the biomass was separated into alfalfa and weeds and those were dried and weighed separately. Um, so there were um, significantly more weeds. This data is not shown by weight in the side of the field that did not get the herbicide spray in season compared to the side that did. In other words, where there was no raptor control, there, was, um, more, there were more weeds. However, within the, the side of the field where the raptor was sprayed or not, uh, there were actually not significant differences by pre-plant treatment. So in other words, what that means is that even though there was more alfalfa present in those plots with pre-plant control, there were also more weeds. And so kind of provides an opportunity to kind of clear out um, some of that weed pressure after first cutting. In terms of the yield results, the highest yielding were those that had the 
the lowest weed pressure. Um, but the ones that had only pre-plant control and no in-season control um, still did yield significantly higher than those with no control, um, although not nearly as high as those that had both. Um, and then the final data point that I collected was alfalfa plants per quadrant after first cutting. And so after the, the first cutting, I went back in and kind of evaluated the remaining alfalfa stand using a 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter quadrant. Um, there were significant differences. Um, so if we're looking at the raptor in season with the pre-plant treatments and not the highest um, were kind of here where both happened. However, where there was no in-season control, the stand was still pretty good. And so, um, you know, with regards to the pre-print treatments, both glyphosate spray and tillage pre-plant did significantly increase alfalfa stand compared to the plots with no plant treatment. But when um, those that were kind of comparing these two numbers, actually there was no statistically significant difference. And so in other words, the raptor in-season didn't seem to make a stronger sand when tillage was used pre-plant. So that kind of would, to me, says that the, the stand is going to kind of recover now that the, the weeds have, have been kind of chopped down, have, have, uh, have germinated, grown, and been chopped down. So in quick summary, pre-plant control is pretty essential for increasing yield and stand count. The highest yields were in plots with both pre-plant and in-season control. Um, the stand counts in plots with pre-plant control, but no in-season herbicide application were still relatively high. And so if in-season control is limited, either because uh, raptor spray, the cost of raptor spray, or because someone is in an organic production system or has some other limitation that does not allow for control in-season, it may actually be possible to do a pre-plant tillage or pre-plant glyphosate spray to control those weeds, establish a good sand, kind of suffer through the first cutting where you have pretty heavy weed pressure, um, have a yield reduction for first cutting, but that the impact may not carry over into subsequent cuttings um, because the stand is still strong underneath the canopy. And in fact, in that plot where I showed the picture um, with the very tall weeds, there was still a lot of alfalfa to be seen in the understory, kind of just waiting to, to flourish. So, okay, with that, I'm gonna move on to a black eye variety trial that we're working on, uh, Rachel and I, with some breeders down at UC Riverside. Um, this is looking at basically two new experimental lines that they're breeding for um, resistance to fusarium wilt, nematodes, and aphids. And the aphid resistance seems to be conferring better ligus tolerance as well, although that's not what is necessarily being bred in. But we are looking at ligus sting as an indication of the bridal success. And so this picture on the left, these are single row plots. Um, CB5 is a commercial variety that's being used as a control. CB77 um, is actually this one that is starting to send us a little earlier. Then we have 74 and CB2 is on the far end next to that buffer. Uh, CB2 is a bit of an older variety that's being used as a control because it's very sensitive to a lot of pests. Um, here on the right side, we're looking actually at the CB, um, 77 on the left and the CB72 on the right. And we can see quite a lot more aphids here in the CB2. Um, and I just wanted to quickly say that at the UCIPM guidelines line, there are black um, that are commercially available already. And it, there's a table that will indicate what the resistance is to fusarium and different nematode species. So if you have those pests in your field, please do consult that. Selecting um, resistant varieties is one of a, is a great way to reduce the need to control in season. Um, okay, so this is that again, CB77 and CB2 at harvest. And I just wanted to show this because it was really quite shocking when we went out to harvest, just the differentiation, the differentiation in number of aphids. Here we see this really, all the black here in this field are aphids. Um, and in CB77, we really saw no aphids. So it was pretty impressive to see this difference. Um, to show some of the yield data, um, this, this graph shows yield CB74 and 77 are the experimental lines on the right. They yielded um, higher than the CB2 or the CB5. Um, though when looking at seed size, um, this, the size was smaller than the CB5. So CB5 is a popular variety. It has really nice large seeds um, and it is um, a, great, a great commercial variety though it does is susceptible to some of these pests. Um, the good news is that the breeders that we're working with at UC Riverside, because they know this is a popular variety, are actually working now to stack resistance to nematodes, fusarium, and aphids, um, which also will confer that ligus tolerance 
in CB5. So that is not available yet, but they are working to try to um, to put these resistance genes that they have been able to breed into CB74 and 77 into the CB5 variety. So hopefully that will be commercially available in the summer of 2022. Um, so we're a couple years out. Um, and again, if you subscribe to our Bean blog, uh, you'll be able to keep updated on when that's happening. So um, the last kind of graph I wanted to show on this was the Ligus stings. And we can see here on the right, CB74 and CB77 did have the lowest number of Ligus stings as compared to the CB2 are kind of susceptible to everything variety and CB5, which is a uh, um, commercially available variety already. Um, so with that, I'm gonna talk quickly about some work that Rachel Long did with Dr. Ken Giles at UC Davis. They wanted to evaluate um, whether or not drones could be used to control the summer worm complex in alfalfa as compared to airplane applications. And um, please feel free to contact Rachel Long if you have any follow-up questions about um, this or any of the subsequent slides that I'll be presenting about her work. Um, her email, I realized I did not put on the slide, but it's rflong at ucanr.edu. And uh, you can also Google her and find her pretty easily. Um, and so this is one of the drones. You can see here the little tank at the bottom and the spray nozzles um, flying over the alfalfa field. This is the summer worm complex that they are they're trying to control. So it's the western yellow striped armyworm, the beet armyworm, and the alfalfa caterpillar. And this is a picture of a field that has been infected. And what they did was they sprayed um, Prevathon insecticide in Yolo County, and they had the control, which is a no, no insecticide spray as compared to a drone or a more traditional aircraft application. Um, they found great news. The drone is as efficient as the airplane um, in terms of control. And the, the cool thing about drones is that they are becoming more and more available. So there is potentially an application if there is um, a bottleneck in terms of getting an airplane to come out or having access to a pilot who can fly um, for growers to kind of have that opportunity to do the spray themselves aerially using drones. Um, and that's why they wanted to evaluate this work just to even see if it, you know, how did it work? Um, at this point, you know, the drone technology is still kind of being evaluated and um, is, I would say, being developed and being uh, kind of advancing very rapidly. And so drone applications are a little more variable in terms of coverage. It's not necessarily due to the drone itself, but it's due to the technology of the nozzles. It was a little bit harder to get a really uniform application with some of the drone nozzles, but um, the anticipation is that that equipment will continue to um, be developed in a way to increase efficacy. Um, another challenge with the drones is that it can only carry 55 pounds total, including the drone unit, and the drone unit is about 10 pounds. Um, so you are limited in the area that you can uh, spray um, at this point. Um, but they, again, are developing drones that are a little bit bigger. So hopefully in the long run, um, that will be released that can carry more water units um, eventually. And this was only really evaluating one, um, one active ingredient for one pest complex, but um, some more work is kind of needed to evaluate others to make sure that it gets into the canopy adequately and in other cropping systems. Um, this, this is that Rachel did, these are preliminary results from 2020, although this is a repeat of some work that she did on the same kind of topic in 2012 and the results were the same. I did decide not to show that data because I, um, just in the interest of time, um, but she was looking at um, gibberellic acid, which is a plant growth regulator um, in black eyed peas to see um, if they would increase yields for the peas. And I would say basically it's too expensive for what happens on the left is the untreated, on the right is the treated. The plants do look bigger, they look great. Um, but in terms of the actual yields, there were no statistical significantly di differences. So on the left is, uh, in the left graph, the furthest left is this yellow bar and that's um, yield in pounds per acre of the, the peas treated with the gibberellic acid and on the right are the untreated. It was a almost 14% difference in yield, but it was not statistically significant. And then if you kind of pencil out that dollars and cents, um, you know, you're spending $50 an acre to apply the treatment, but maybe making an extra $10 in terms of the yield difference. So it does end up actually being more expensive than, than it is worth at this point for field crops. 
Um, and then on the right side, this is seed weight in terms of grams per thousand seed. Um, and there were no differences in, in the individual seed weights. So, you know, potentially this would work in other cropping systems, but in field crops, it doesn't really seem to be super economical um, at this point. Um, the last topic I wanted to talk about is just give a quick pest management update in hemp. Um, this is an emerging field crop in our state. And I just want to acknowledge some of my colleagues who are working on this with me, Dan Putnam and Bob Hutmacher who are um, corporate extension specialists for the state with statewide appointments. Um, we have observed agricultural pests in hemp um, that are pests in other cropping systems, um, but it's unconfirmed yet if they all cause significant loss or damage into hemp. And so it's really important that we spend more time with this crop to really know what uh, pests actually require treatment and require crop loss or crop significant crop damage and which are just present in the hemp field. Um, so here are some pictures of agricultural pests that have been observed, but we have not actually confirmed uh, crop loss. Webworms, and this is this picture here, it does seem like when they attack young plants there may be a risk. It's unclear if the young plants are able to grow out of it or not. Um, and then this is leaf miner. So leaf miner can cause this visible damage in the leaves, but there's no evidence yet that it actually causes severe enough damage to affect crop yield. And so really that's kind of what we're looking for is like not necessarily even evidence, but evidence that there's um, a reduction in loss. Um, and I will say that it depends on what part of the hemp is uh, being harvested, but because most growers are growing it for CBD, they're harvesting the flower. Um, pests like this that are kind of attacking the leaves aren't necessarily going to affect the final quality of the harvested product. This last picture is actually spotted cucumber beetle um, and then ligus mites were others that were observed but um, it's not clear if they actually cause yield loss. So um, this on the other hand corn, or, corn earworm and tomato tobacco budworm can cause severe flower damage so this is the tobacco budworm this is the larvae of the corn earworm, they're kind of nasty. They bite the cola off or the flower right before harvest and it causes this like necrotic area, which uh, makes it an unharvestable uh, product. And so this is so far, these two insect pests are the only ones that we can really confirm like do are very problematic for hemp production. Uh, moving briefly into diseases that have been observed in the state, this is um, botrytis blight. The symptoms are very similar to a corn earworm damage and tobacco budworm damage. And actually when we first had that previous field, the um, somebody had told us that they, that they thought it was botrytis bite. And then when we opened it up, we found those little larvae in there. Um, and with botrytis, you would see the spores. Um, this in the middle is the beet curly top virus. And on the right is powdery mildew. Um, while beet curly top virus and botrytis appear to be problematic, um, the powdery mildew, was observed, but the pressure was really mild and it actually didn't require treatment. So I've heard anecdotally, a lot of people talk about powdery mildew, but I haven't actually heard of anyone talking about crop loss or crop reduction because of powdery mildew. So again, it's just really important with this new crop to not um, jump to control. Um, the control options are really limited anyway, but to not um, jump to control or jump to feel that there's an issue um, before we know if it actually is gonna be affecting the final harvest. Uh, um, as with all of us, it's really important to protect bees and other beneficials. Male hemp plants are very attractive to bees. On my website, you can find this one pager on uh, best practices for managing um, insects in hemp while protecting bees and other beneficials. Um, this is a picture of a dragonfly. There are a ton of beneficials in hemp fields. Um, and although most of the hemp plants grown are female, the males do make it in and they produce a ton of pollen and typically are, um, are are flowering at the time in the season when the, the rest of the landscape is a little devoid of food. And so they can just be like these huge draws for these beneficials in the landscape. Um, and then there is a new resource, herbicide damage on hemp. Some work I worked on with Brad Hansen at UC Davis. You can see the symptoms at the herbicide symptomology website. This is a picture of glyphosate spray and what that does to hemp. And just remember, always talk to your ag commissioner. Regulations are changing. Um, and what determines if a pesticide can be used on hemp is that it has to be exempt from residue tolerance requirements, it has to be exempt from registration, and the use of the product would not be legally considered a use in conflict with the registered label. So there's a pretty narrow amount of products that can be sprayed at this point, and I highly advise um, always talking to your ag commissioner first to make sure that um, 
you're able to, um, you're applying appropriate spray. The last thing I wanted to mention before I wrap up is a pest alert for a new and very problematic weed that we're starting to see more and more of in our area. Um, it's Canada thistle. This is a perennial plant. It produces a very deep taproot and it can re-sprout and re-spread. Like many of our uh, perennial plants, um, if the, the part of the root or the, is getting moved around the field, it can, it can come again. So it's very important um, to, to control this plant right away. This is a prohibited weed for seed production. So if you do any seed production um, or you have any neighboring fields that do seed production, there's a zero tolerance for this. Um, CCI, CCIA, the California Crop Improvement Association, who is charged with certifying seed fields, has stated that they have a zero tolerance for um, the prohibitive weeds and that if they see the Canada thistle in any life stage, not even that it's flowering and producing seed, but in any life stage, that they will reject the lot. So it's, it's important um, to be able to identify it and then to control it. Um, the, <clears throat> excuse me, because of the deep tap root, it is a little bit hard to sometimes pull it out of the field, although that really is the best opportunity to get all of that material out of the field. And once it is pulled up, really you gotta get it, get it out of there. Don't, don't leave it in a way that it can get chopped up and re-sprout later. Um, just really physically remove it from the field. There isn't, there isn't that much in our area yet. It's kind of a new weed, so we just wanna make sure that it doesn't spread. Um, and then the other important thing to remember about this weed is, um, there really are a few options for controlling Canada thistle and row crop ground. There are some um, herbicides that work in rangeland, but their plant back uh, is really long. And so there isn't, there aren't really very many good options in row crop ground. Roguing it really is great, pulling out the whole root. Um, a glyphosate spray in the fall, when the Canada thistle is translocating the carbohydrates down to the root will be very effective. Um, one thing to remember with a herbicide application though, is that you don't want to apply it at a really high rate and burn down um, the weed because it'll just re-sprout from that tap root. You want to kind of apply it at a rate that will allow the, plot, the plant to really translocate that product down into the tap root and have it die a slow um, and painful death. And then that's a way to ensure good control along those lines as well. Um, because it has to be translocated into the roots, it's really important that the herbicide spray is made when the plant is actively growing, when the Canada thistle is actively growing um, and actively translocating, translocating carbohydrates. Um, in other words, you're relying on the plant to kind of do the work of moving that, um, that active ingredient throughout its, um, its uh, roots and all of that. Um, applying, it in, applying glyphosate in the spring may be effective. I mean, you may have to do multiple years of treatment to eradicate a thick patch once it's established, but um, it's really important to, again, if you're doing any seed production, which we do a lot in our area, to just make sure that it's not spreading. Um, and I will just say this blog here down at the bottom, which is on the UC Weed Science blog um, on November 29th of this year, so just a few weeks ago, has a lot more details about um, this new weed. So thank you. Uh, with that, I will take any questions before break, and I may go in and launch my poll first. Okay, so the, the two questions that I have are both true-false. Um, one, pre-plant weed control is not important when establishing alfalfa stands because weeds can be controlled in season. And two, all known agricultural plant pests found in hemp should be controlled to avoid yield loss. Sarah, you have one question in the chat. Do you want to, uh, me to read it now or do you want to do the poll first, finish the poll first? Um, you, can, you can read it now. Okay, it's from Hannah. Do they know the mechanism for resistance conferring genes for aphids on soybeans? Is it molecular or do they change the morphology of the plant? Um, so just to clarify, we we're talking about black eyed peas in that presentation. Um, in terms of the mechanism for resistance, um, I do think that it is molecular, although I'm not a breeder, but I did not see, I don't believe that there are morphological changes that are preventing it to make it, you know, like less hospitable to the aphid or anything like that. I think it's um, something molecular. 
but I can confirm that with the breeder. Mm -hmm. If you have any other questions, please post them in the chat for Sarah. I'll just do like one more minute with the thing. Oh, actually we have 85% already voted. So we'll wrap it up now. Um, so the first question, pre-plant weed control is not important when establishing alfalfa stands because weeds can just be controlled in season. Um, this is false. It is really important to control weeds pre-plant um, to enable the alfalfa stand to be able to develop. Um, question number two, all known agricultural pests found in hemp should be controlled to avoid yield loss. Um, this is also false. Um, there are many known agricultural plant pests that are found in California that we do not know if they are actual true pests of hemp or if they are just present in the hemp field. And so really it is not necessary to spray or try to control all agricultural, known agricultural pests in hemp. That is false. Uh, thank you so much. With that, we have our um, next break. Our last talk resumes at 1025 and um, we will see you then. Thank you.
Okay, we're gonna get started here in just one minute. Scott, if you wanna pull up your slides, I'll stop sharing mine. Okay, our final speaker today is uh, Scott Bowden from the Sutter County Agricultural Commissioner's Office. He'll be giving, giving a regulatory update um, and then we'll have a few minutes for wrap up at the end. Uh, please don't forget that you have to answer all the poll questions and take the quiz that we will email out after this um, and pass with at least 70% in order to get your DPR credits. Thank you. And everyone can see my screen, correct? I hope. Yes, we can. Perfect. All right, I apologize. I'm having some issues with my iPad, so no one gets to see me today. You just get to see my presentation. Uh, but I am, again, like Sarah said, I'm Scott Bowden. I'm Deputy Ag Commissioner for Sutter County in charge of the Pesticide Use Enforcement Division. And so I will be given a regulatory update. Maybe, there we go. And this is what I'll briefly go over um, during this session. We'll, we're gonna go over our permitting process for 2020 and 2021 um, with our COVID restrictions in place, kind of the top 20, uh, top violations for 2020 and some uh, regulatory updates for chloropyrifos, paraquat and decontamination facilities pesticide use near schools. I do have some updates on fungicide use over flooded orchards or standing water. And then a discussion on bewarecalifornia.org and electronic use reporting. So with, well, with everything, um, I guess in life right now, uh, Sutter County, has some new restrictions in place with COVID-19, specifically where it comes to issuing permits this year. Um, some of you may have already contacted our office to renew your permit. Some of you may not have. What we're asking this year is that there are no walk-ins. Everything will be scheduled ahead of time. And part of that scheduling process will utilize either Microsoft Teams to share our screen with, with you so that we can both look at your permit and maps to make sure that everything is correct. And we'll either utilize Teams or if it's a very small permit with no changes, it can also be done on the phone. But that setup process will happen before you walk into the office. And once that setup process is done, we'll schedule a date and time for you to come in for a very quick signature and a review. And what that review process does is it allows one, some face-to-face -face time and two, to really go over any of the permit conditions that are associated with your permit. Um, the other big change we're doing this year for our permitting is that for private, app private applicator certificates uh, ending in the letter, last names ending with R through Z this year, we're only offering the test on Fridays. And we're doing this to reduce the number of, um, one, reduces the number of people in the office, and two, it, it gives us more chance to permitting. So we're doing our private applicator certificates on Fridays in groups of six starting at eight o'clock in the morning for roughly two hours. If you need more than two hours of time during that test time, we can we can work that through. But really, we're trying to schedule those over only on Fridays. Uh, we haven't had a lot of private applicators yet. There are quite a few opportunities such as today to get hours. Uh, and those hours, as long as you maintain your or obtain six hours of continuing education classes, two of which in laws and regulations before the end of this calendar year, you can apply those to renew your private applicator card. So the top five-ish violations, I kind of threw another one in because I threw pesticide use reports in, Code of Regulations 6626, 
because we are right in the middle of doing record audits on on growers and typically during this time of year when we're doing record audits that's where we find you a lot of use report issues so that may um, come back into the top five as as they stand right now but really these top five violations they could be any year because these are things that we see on a year-to-year -year basis and that is um, conflict with label food and agricultural code 12973 it's conflict with either the pesticide label or a condition put in place on your permit by the ag commissioner um, California Code of Regulations 6434, Notice of Intent to Apply Restricted Materials. Uh, California Code of Regulations 6614, Protection of Persons, Animals, and Property. And that's really the, the code that we use if, there is a, if there's a drift complaint within the county. And pesticides have drifted from your location onto a, a non-target site. And then Code of Regulations 6738, and 6726, that's uh, personal protection equipment for employees and emergency, emergency medical care posting for employees. And really anything under that 6700 category is worker protection standards. And in each one of these, I'll break down in a slide here in a minute. And then of course, pesticide use reports. So I think you've heard, everyone has heard this mantra a lot from us and from, from the Department of Pesticide Regulations. <laughs> the label is the law and Food and Agricultural Code 12973, that's where this, that term is really coming from. And what we're looking for is whatever the label says, you as the applicator, you as the grower have to follow that and your employees have to follow that. And there's a lot of good information on the label that can be found. Um, and really what you should what should happen is as you have as your employee especially if it's an employee is about to make an application really sit down and review the label with them especially if it's the first time during the year document that review kind of like a tailgate session hey you're going to use roundup power max or whatever the case may be go over the parts of the label the brand name the common name the formulation the precautionary statements signal words and direction for use these all have important information for the application for the safety of both you and uh, your employees. So the signal words, caution, warning, danger, those talk about the toxicity, a quick view of the toxicity of that pesticide. And it also gives you a good idea if you have employees that are applying, if it's a warning or danger level pesticide, that indicates that your employee has to have additional personal protection equipment, such as coveralls, regardless if the label says that or says it requires coveralls or not. As soon as it says warning or danger, coveralls would be required. All of this can be found in the precautionary statements. The list of personal protection equipment is found in the precautionary statements and the list of hazards, such as hazards to bees and wildlife. Those are all in precautionary statements. Um, and again, that's the minimum PPE that should be applied or should be worn during the application. So, yeah. pesticide use reports and notices of intent. The, these both seem like paperwork issues and, and really pesticide use reports is a paperwork issue. It's you're required to do 100% use report. That's another one of the um, things you'll hear a lot from us and from, from DPR, 100% use reporting. Anything that's applied on your field that has a California registration number or an EPA red, um, number needs to be reported to the county in which it was applied. And so we're looking at that specifically during this time of year, we start looking at that as we do record audits. The notices of intent though are, are, are a little bit, um, a little bit more than paperwork because really the notice of intent to apply a restricted material is what closes out your restricted materials permit. And that allows us to do a final review of both the use of that restricted material 
and the surrounding areas to see if there are any environmental factors that should be considered before um, finalizing and allowing that application to occur. So when there's NOIs are not submitted, that is a higher standard that we're looking at for uh, than use reports. So if you're not submitting use NOIs, what you'll find is a higher fine if we go that route than with a pesticide use report. And as you can see, I'm just working through the top five violations right now. So worker health and safety requirements. Again, these are all of the 6700 series within California Code of Regulations. So there are two items that if you have employees, they always need to be worn. And that's eye protection and gloves. What 6738 and there's a bunch of codes after 6738, this point 1.2.3 and so forth. They give definitions of who has to wear person, whatever, in this case, gloves, and then what type of gloves. So it defines that personal protection equipment for chemical resistant gloves has to be 14 mils. That's new as of a few years ago. Um, they have to be specific to whatever the label says and that flocked gloves or non-separable liners are prohibited. There are some exemptions within the code of regulations as well. So 14 mil gloves are fairly thick as anybody who's worn them knows. There's an exemption within the code of regulations that allows for the thinner um, nitrile gloves to be worn if anything that requires dexterity like changing out nozzles. However, there's a time limit on that. So that's a generally a 15 minute time limit. And that doesn't mean you can stack those 15 minutes up. It's take the 14 mils off, put your thin nitriles on, change out the nozzles or whatever has to be done that's within with pesticides and then put the 14 mil gloves back on. Again, with the worker health and safety requirements, we have eye protection. And again, if we dig into the code section, into 6738, it will give specifics on what type of eye protection. And remember that eye protection has to have, it says brown here, but it's front and brow and temple protection. And now there is a uh, OSHA impact rating. So we want to be able to see that it has an ANSI Z87 requirements on those safety glasses. But also check the label. As you're reviewing the label prior to the application, make check the precautionary statements, look for the PPE. Does it, does the label specify safety glasses are okay or does it require goggle, safety goggles or a face shield? You wanna go with what the label says and then 6738 will help define what kind of safety glasses or what kind of goggles. Oh, I thought I had a question. And then coveralls, this is, this is where we get into the reg regulatory requirement that if the signal word says warning or danger on the pesticide label, employees have to have coveralls on. Before I move into the um, kind of the regulatory updates, those are kind of the quick and dirty, if you would, of the uh, top violations we had. Are there I didn't see if there's any questions, but I can certainly answer questions at the end too. So chlorpyrifos, this is nothing new. We have been uh, at every one of our grower meetings that we've had, um, we have been discussing chlorpyrifos and the eventual cancellation. Um, there has been an increasing amount of uh, conditions set on the use of chlorpyrifos. And as of the end of this year, in two and a half weeks, uh, you're no longer allowed to possess, to use or possess chlorpyrifos in California. Again, this is nothing new. I would suggest if you have any um, unopened containers of chlorpyrifos, contact your pesticide dealers, see if there's some way to return that. Otherwise, you may have to uh, contact a hazardous waste disposal of some sort. There are some exemptions still for granular products, although they are ratcheting down on that as well. So 
if you have questions on if a product is can be used, contact your Ag Commissioner. Paraquad update. Again, this is, we're looking at due dates now. And so remember Paraquat, this is a federal label update. Paraquat is one of the most widely used herbicides in the United States. It's extremely toxic. And that's, there's been 17 deaths since 2000 based on ingestion. And that is why, that's what prompted the label change on the federal level. And what the label changes are now say that only certified applicators that have completed an EPA training can mix load and apply. Start and what also happened on the federal level is that they required a new integrated closed system within those containers. So those containers are on the market now um, and the new label is on the market now. However, there are still some of the older labels out as well. So it, it's really imperative of you to, again, review the label, both for yourself and for your employees and which Paraquat label do you have? And here's what, here's some example. Well, again, remember that you have to, have, to be a certified applicator. You have to be, in California, you have to have a private applicator card issued through your local ag commissioner. And to use Paraquat, you have to go through that EPA approved training program. We would like a copy of that certificate so that it's easy for us as we review notices of intent, we can just pull up your file and go, okay, you have a private applicator and you have the EPA approved program. Otherwise we're making a bunch of phone calls and we will call you if, if Paraquat uh, NOI start coming in because we wanna make sure that everyone has these requirements met before the application takes place. So the old restricted use label, again, it would say for retail sale to and to and use only by certified applicators or persons under their direct supervision. And this is the old label for Parazone. The new labels now say not to be used by uncertified persons working under the super, supervision, not to be used. So you have to be a certified applicator now. You cannot have your employees go out and spay, spray Paraquat, Gramoxone, Parazone by themselves. They have to have a private applicator cert and they have to have gone through the EPA class. Another big change, and again, this is, from a, this is from a year or so ago, but we're still seeing some um, issues with this out in the field is that there were some changes to decontamination facility requirements. And the big one is the amount of water needed for employees. So decontamination facilities always are soap water and single use towels. And then part of that also is one pint of emergency eyewash and then a change of coveralls if the employee is wearing warning, is applying warning or danger pesticides. Part of the new requirements is, is that at the beginning of each workday for each handler at that site, there needs to be three gallons of water for washing. And again, the decontamination facility needs to be at the mixed load site and no more than a quarter mile from the handler. Um, this non-production hundred feet from mixed load site that, that may be changing here soon as well but that would be at a, at a hauling facility or, or something like that. So, hmm, I had more. Pesticide use in your schools. So again, this is a, this is something we've, we've, we've all been working through for the past several years. However, with COVID, and with schools working from home in some areas and some areas they've brought kids back to school, it's imperative that you check with the schools, check with the ag commissioners, make sure that if you're next, if you're within a quarter mile of a school site, is that school in session? Do they have children at school or are they all at home? It's, it's, sometimes it's hard to tell now. So remember that the new, these new regulations are production ag within a quarter mile of public schools, K through 12, 
and licensed childcare facilities. Uh, and it's no applications Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And that's the quarter mile is for aerial applications and for air blast sprayers. If it's a um, broadcast or if it's a broadcast break, it's 25 feet, or if it's a strip spray, it's 25 feet. There is an annual notification requirement, and that notification is due to the schools and to us by April 30th. So it is in effect for the next school year. Um, what Sutter County has been doing, and we've been doing it for several years, is we try to get that done as you renew your permit. So that will be part of the process here as you renew your, as you start calling us and asking for, to renew your permit. One of the items that's not in this slideshow and it re I reminded myself with renewals is that there is a new, uh, some new paperwork that we're asking um, everyone to everyone with a restricted material to fill out and we're what we're doing is it's it this has always been a requirement to consider mitigation and alternatives to use for restricted materials prior to spraying and, and you're you've done this your pca has done this and they've notated that in recommendations for any time you spray a, a restricted material and now we're asking to document that prior to issuing a permit so when you call us and you ask for a to renew your permit, we're going to say, hey, we see that you have Paraquat and 2,4-D on your permit. And we're going to send you a piece of paper that says, we need to know if you what, what alternatives or what mitigation practices you've considered, whether that's um, using glyphosate, using some sort of non-restricted materials. We just need to notate, notate that and document that. And that'll be, that, that's new. It's statewide. Every commissioner's office is, is doing that at this point. So although every, everyone has slightly different forms, we're all asking the same basic information. So all right, on to this flood, fungicides over flooded orchards. So I think it's been said a couple of times this morning, this looks like it's going to be a fairly dry winter, um, but that doesn't mean there hasn't been some updates in this issue. So for, for several years during particularly wet years, um, if there has, or if there were standing water in orchards, uh, the Department of Pesticide Regulations would issue an emergency, a letter for emergency application of for use of fungicide over those standing water. Um, most lab, fungicide labels prohibit these applications. Um, and including all the copper products, they would, it's, if you read through the label, it'll say, do not apply over standing water, do not apply near running water. And during what years when we'd have essentially flooded orchards and we, you'd still need to make those applications, letters would be issued that would allow for those emergency applications. Starting in 2019, um, DPR no longer issued those letters and kind of put it back on industry to rework the labels or ask for special local needs. So this year we have at least there's um, right now there's four special local needs out that have been submitted to DPR and there it looks uh, looks like there are a few more coming down the pipeline. So hopefully by the time hopefully we get a lot of water. Hopefully we don't have a lot of flooded orchards, but if we come to that point there may be additional labels. So check with your PCA, check with your Ag Commissioner's office um, if this affects you, if you need to use a fungicide and your orchard is flooded. And it would still, it would be for, even though, even these label changes are still gonna be for standing water, not for water moving off of the field. It's, it would still be similar to how the letters used to stand, so. So BewareCalifornia.com is a new tool um, that is, allows you as the applicator to determine if there are any bee sites, beekeepers, apiaries within a mile of wherever you're making that application. Um, it was 
kind of put together through the CAPCA, uh, California Association of Pest Control Advisors, and uses some of the uses some help with Agran and CDMS. And what it allows you to do is, is create an account through Beware California so that you, the applicator, can log on and say, I'm making an application to my site at this location. Are there any bees within a mile? And if there are bees within a mile, it will say yes. Uh, strike, strike an apiaries or, or one of the local apiaries is within a mile. Here's the number to call. It won't give you an exact location of where that where those bees are, are but it will say within a mile of this application site, here, here's who you need to call. And what you'll see when you log in and you create an account, you have there's several options. So beekeepers can log in if you happen to, if there happen to be any beekeepers on this call, you can register your beehives, you can ask for notification, and you can do all your movements through Beware California. If you're a pest control advisor, you can log in, create an account, and as you're writing recommendations, you can see, again, where bees are so that you can write that on your recommendation. Hey, there are bees within a mile of this application. Make sure you contact these beekeepers. Or if you're the applicator, you can, again, you can log in through access grower bee check and you can do a bee check yourself. And what that does is that it's one less phone call to make. Previous years, you would call the ag commissioner's office and you'd say, I'm spraying a pesticide. There's, I just wanna see if there's any bee. I wanna do a bee check. Beware California allows you to do that electronically from your phone, from your house. On a weekend, you can make those checks by yourself. And the reason we're doing this is that we need to make sure that there are pests. Obviously, there are pesticides that are toxic to bees, and you want to look for hive, hives and blooming plants. And again, reviewing the labels to make sure that what you're spraying, if it says toxic to bees, that's when you need to start notifying the beekeepers. That's when you need to start making these, either call, contacting your ag commissioner's office to do a bee check or log in through beewarecalifornia.com and looking to see who, who needs to be notified. These beekeepers need to be notified 48 hours prior to that application. So that allows them a chance to move or it allows you two to discuss um, when an appropriate time is preferably when they're inactive, one to two hours, one hour before sunset or two hours before sunrise and temperatures below 55 degrees. That's typically what they're, what they're looking for. But again, it's a 48 hour prior to the application. You need to notify if it's, if there's blooming plants and they're actively foraging in that field. See any. So Sutter County has had a recycling, uh, recy uh, recycling container program for several years called Kill the Bug, Recycle the Jug. And we've made some significant changes this year. Um, prior to, well, this year and before, we've had uh, kind of these mobile cotton trailers and we've had cotton trailers staged at various pest control dealers and various sites throughout the county. And we would allow for remote drop off of containers. And then we'd have our recycler come up on given days and we'd have events using these, utilizing these trailers. We've started noticing issues over the past couple of years of garbage being thrown in there, uh, contaminated containers being dropped off because these are, these remote trailers are, are not being watched. Um, improperly cut up 30 gallon containers or not the right kind of plastic being dropped off to. And there was really no control over what was being dropped off. So we have pulled back all the cotton cotton trailers and we've we've kind of reached out to a different recycler who brings in um, 40 yard containers from Recology. And what we're going to do instead of having you know, six or eight recycling days per year. We're gonna increase, we've increased the number of recycling days and a little more oversight in how we do it. And we're still in the process of, of really nailing down the exact dates, but we will put that information on our 
website. We will put it on our Facebook page and we will get that information out to you. But we'll, the major change in the program is that there's, there's no longer cotton trailers. There's no longer drop-offs unless there's somebody there. So we're, we're kind of managing this program a little differently. We will be there all, all the times so there, and there will be more opportunities to drop off typically right after major events, like right after dormant sprays or right after bloom spray or right after rice. You know, so you don't have to have a, large, a lot of containers stacked up in your yard. You have a place to take them to. These are examples of, of what we've seen in the last year. So we've have contaminated containers. Uh, while these are cut properly, they're, they're just too dirty to be put in. And the problem is as soon as something like this goes into, gets ground up and put in their bag, that whole entire bag potentially is, is no longer can be used to by the recycler. And so they won't accept that. These are dirty. That's obviously dirty. This is oil. They can't accept oil. They can't accept um, obviously lids and um, labels have to be removed. But what we're really looking at here is dirty, contaminated and oily. And none of these would be acceptable. That would be kicked out. If they're stained, a lot of these, a lot of products can't are just stain the white plastic and that's acceptable. It's the residue that's not. So again, we're gonna have more, more dates at temporary sites and at basically at the end of historic spring times. So the last thing I wanna really kind of touch on is electronic use report. Um, through Calag permits. And I know a lot of you have Calag permit logins. If you don't have that with either Sutter County or the other counties that you farm in, I would highly suggest doing that. You have to have a different login, a unique username for every county that you do business in. But once you get an account with Calag permits, you're allowed to submit your, your use reports electronically. You can submit your notices of intent electronically. If you have multiple permits, you can drop down and find all of your different permits to submit those documents. And you can do queries and pull up all of your use report history for a given year. So if you need to run a quick printout of everything you did on this block for a year or this permit for a year to turn in, you can quickly do that yourself through your own Calag permit account. And any of us here at, in the county can set that up for you. It's, it's a quick process. It sets you up to, to get into and basically look at everything that we can look at. And that's really what I have to say today. If you have questions, again, my name is Scott Bowden. I can be reached at uh, the main number here for Sutter County, 822-7500. We do have a... Uh, generic pesticide use email now. It's sutteragpue at co.sutter.ca.us. If you have questions and you don't exactly know who to ask, send it to sutteragpue and somebody will get back to you. We also have a very active Facebook. Lisa Herbert, our ag commissioner is in charge, uh, updates that Facebook page on a very regular basis with all sorts of good information, um, both for our department and for the county as well. So please, if you haven't checked out our Facebook page, check it out. It's uh, at Sutter County Ag. Uh, she, we, she puts a lot of work into that. It's, it's, a, it's a good Facebook page. And well, thank you so much. Um, I think we're running, unfortunately, a little low on time for questions, but please email Scott and let's go yep. ahead and get all launched. Um, Scott, if you'll stop sharing your screen, I'll put up our final slide so people can get the QR code for their credits. Thank you. Perfect, I'm out. All right, so question number one, I made a bunch of questions, I'm sorry. So question number one, what is the most common cite violation cited during a county inspection? Lack of personal protection equipment, failing to follow the label, no emergency medical care posting or no decontamination facility for employees. 
Uh, question number two, what part of the pesticide label can you find a list of the required personal protection equipment, precautionary statement, general information, dis storage and disposal, directions for use? You guys are experts in this. Well, one person is an expert. Uh, what are two pieces of documentation, what two pieces of documentation are now required to apply Paraquat? Uh, operator identification number and a MasterCard, because everything costs money nowadays. Uh, private applicator card and a restricted materials permit, or an EPA approved certified certificate of completion and a private applicator card. Number four, how much water is required to be at a mixed load site? when employees apply pesticides. Uh, at least nine gallons of water, sufficient amount of water, at least three gallons of water per handler at the beginning of each day, or one pint of emergency water. That one's kind of a trick question, actually. And finally, when must you notify surrounding beekeepers of pesticide applications? When they call you, when you make a pesticide application within a mile of a hive, when bees are actively foraging on your property or 48 hours prior to applying a pesticide that is toxic to bees. Scott, thank you so much. While we wait yep. for people to um, answer your polls and before you go over the answers, just a quick reminder um, to, you can scan this code here for CCA credits. The DPR quiz will be emailed and you must take the quiz and pass with a 70% rate in order to get credits for the, the webinar. Um, thank you all so much for attending and um, we're really pleased to um, have such good attendance. Uh, thanks, Scott. Thank you. And Scott, while we um, wait for the rest of the poll answers to come in, there is one question in the chat. Yeah. It's, is the ANSI 87.1 a new goggle requirement? No, that's been in effect for several years now. Um, it is that the ANSI Z87 is printed on the on the safety glasses on the brow typically or the the brow piece. It's not a new requirement. It's been in there for five or six years now. It's just something that um, we're tending to look at a little bit more carefully. And it Z87 is really an impact requirement, but it's it's. It is a requirement. It does show that the safety glasses are a stronger caliper than say sunglasses. And I think that's that's really why it's there. Are there any other questions in the, I seem to have lost track of that. I don't see any other questions in the chat. We have 90% in the polls, so we can probably end that and share the results. Okay. Nope, it's switched. All right, so the most common violation cited during our county inspections is failing to follow the label, Food and Ag Code 12973. Lack of PPE, that's right up there too. That is a label requirement, but that was um, typically it's, it's 12973. If we're gonna cite any, anything, it's, it's 12973, lack of following the label properly. Um, Precautionary statements is where you find on the label is where you find personal protection equipment. And again, remember you need an EPA approved certificate of completion and a private applicator card to apply Paraquat now. That includes your employees. Uh, we will be offering uh, PAC tests for any employee that needs to do that. You need to have three gallons of water per handler at the beginning of each day for washing. You also need to have um, there also is a eye washing station requirements, and that's where the nine gallons can come in. I didn't really talk about that, but there is uh, eye washing requirements too. So it's a hose with gently want running water is sufficient for that. But three gallons is required at the beginning of each workday. And then again, 48 hours, you need to notify beekeepers 48 hours prior to spraying anything that's toxic to bees. And that's all I got. Thanks so much. Okay, well, uh, keep your eyes peeled for the quiz in your email. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and end the meeting. Thank you.